why we're going to be starting with that this morning. Welcome back, everyone. Hope everyone had a good lunch. And we actually got to see sunshine briefly in Dewey Beach, so that was a good sign. Weather's definitely improving. It only had one way to go. Uh, we have, have a special guest today, Sam Roush. He's the Deputy Assistant Administrator for Regulatory Programs. Thank you for being here. You're good. You, you don't have it's up to you. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, well, thank you. I had not necessarily planned on saying anything. I, I am trying to go to all the different councils. So I'm Sam Rock. I am the Deputy Director of the National Fishery Service. I oversee the work of all of our regional offices, including GARFO. Um, I also oversee our protected resources work, uh, our habitat conservation work, and as I said, the sustainable fisheries work. So we've got the three headquarters offices of those three headquarters offices and then all of the five regional offices. And I've been trying to go to the various councils periodically. For those of you who I've not met, I do periodically try to go once every year or so to the various councils to, to check in, give you an opportunity, if you want to, to, to ask about national policies broader than the region. Um, and also to, to say, continuously to say thanks to you all for all the work that you're doing. Um, we, we collectively uh, manage the seafood, the fish harvest, the recreational opportunity in this country, and it is an enormous economic driver it's an enormous cultural driver uh, in many areas it's a subsistence issue for fishery for, for coastal communities it's an important part of the coastal community fabric um, we landed about 2.55 255 billion uh, seafood landings were about 255 billion last year and support about 1.8 million million jobs uh, we lasted about we landed collectively about a billion fish recreationally and all of that is really important and all of that is sustainably done because of the work that you all do here and it's not easy to do that work and it has it has taken 30 years to get to this point uh, so you and your predecessors have all worked really hard on behalf of not only the constituents that you all represent but on behalf of the american people and it shows right we we have uh we have very low levels of overfishing very low levels of overfish stocks um, we are managing the stock sustainably in a very transparent, open fashion in which we get a lot of stakeholder input. We, are, we base everything on the science. Um, this whole enterprise could not be done without you. And I just want to take an opportunity to say thank you all for everything that you have done and that you are going to continue to do uh, for this council and for the American people. I'm happy to take any questions if you want, but that was all I was going to say. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Is there any questions? And Sam will be here tonight, so we can definitely drill him later for plenty of questions. Yeah, I'll be here through midday tomorrow. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Let's start with our first afternoon agenda item. Russ Dunn will be giving us a presentation 
on saltwater recreational fisheries policy. And Russ, the floor is yours. All right, thank you. Uh, I am Russ Dunn. I'm the National Policy Advisor for Recreational Fisheries. With me is Sean Morton from National Ocean Service, who is working with the RecFish team to uh, update and overhaul the RecFish policy uh, at this time. So, first of all, I want to say thank you for, to the Council for the opportunity to uh, brief you on this and, and really just begin to uh, solicit inputs from you as a Council and individuals. Uh, on needed or desired updates, uh, we encourage you to submit comments uh, through the portal or to the email and you'll see all that information uh, towards the end of the presentation. So first, let me give a little bit of a background here to the policy. Uh, the final policy was put out in 2015 after a, about an eight month long effort to solicit public input. We had as an agency committed to developing a policy during the 2014 Wreckfish Summit. Uh, and then we put the final policy out in February of 2015 down at the Miami Boat Show in, in an event with the National Marine Manufacturers. So fast forward. Fast forward to today. Why are we updating this? Well, we in March we held the fourth National Wreckfish Summit. Uh, during which we recognized that the current or the existing policy was, had a few gaps in it. It did not address climate in any way. It did not address uh, expanding ocean uses such as wind uh, and aquaculture in any way. And we realized that in order to remain relevant, we needed to uh, update the policy. So what you see on the screen here are simply general discussion questions we put as prompts uh, to help uh, sort of solicit inputs. Uh, you're certainly welcome to go deviate beyond these questions, but we just uh, will put these back up again at the end as we get into uh, a discussion. So policy purpose, why bother to have a policy? What is it? What does it do? So in short, it's a guidance document. It serves as a tool that helps to shape the agency's approach to recreational fisheries by articulating our basic stance, our goals, guiding principles. And it also importantly, I think serves as a tool for the public to understand how we do approach uh, uh, the agency. What are our priorities uh, and, and goals for recreational fisheries? So the policy statement itself is, is pretty straightforward it, and it essentially sets forth no fisheries commitment to accessible and diverse uh, sustainable recreational fisheries for the benefit of the nation. The scope of the policy uh, is, uh, you know, for any policy, it's, it, I think it's essential to know to whom or to what that policy re refers or, per or pertains. And this is actually a more diff, uh, more of a challenge than than one might think, and, and this is a place where we're getting a fair amount of input uh, as we go around. There's there's a lot of question of should it be expanded to better address uh, subsistence type fishing, non-commercial cultural practices, and, and etc. Oh, and I see the pictures have slid up over the very bottom line. Um, so this is an area where we would appreciate input from uh, the council uh, in particular. You know, there's a lot of concern about how do we ensure that we capture sort of those shoreside fishermen who may not have access to a boat, but who uh, still have access to federal resources as they come in and, and may really depend on it for, uh, for sustenance. So policy goals, you can see here that the, the, the policy goals are, are fairly straightforward and direct, essentially support and maintain healthy resources on which wreck fisheries depend, right? If you don't have fish or you don't have healthy stocks, you're not going to have robust recreational fisheries. Promote wreck fishing for the benefit of the nation. That's straight out of Magnuson. And then finally, uh, to enable long term participation through science based conservation and management. Obviously, as, an, as a natural resource agency, we're interested in not only ensuring participation now, but uh, into the future for future generations as well. And as a science-based agency, we do that or seek to do that through uh, science-based conservation and management decisions. 
So the guiding principle. So in crafting the original policy, we felt it was important to not only set out our position and goals, but essentially um, approaches to how those goals might best be achieved. And, and this is how they were uh, really born. And I'll touch on these in a little more detail uh, in the next couple of slides here. So the first supporting ecosystem conservation enhancement, you know, without healthy ecosystems, as we just said about the goals, you're not going to have and can't have healthy fisheries. And, and we thought it was essential to really identify um, that relationship or <clears throat> in the policy. You know, we've, we as an agency have uh, supported this uh, guiding principle through uh, uh, substantial amounts of work on healthy habitats, partnering with with uh, with uh, private entities and recreational fishermen to serve and restore habitats, best handling and release practices. Um, we've spent about a million dollars in the last 10 years uh, through my program uh, on descending devices and release gears, working with states uh, and commissions and councils trying to, to move those dollars out. You all are certainly taking the lead in, in this um, with shifting to EBFM. And so it's a it's an area where the agency and the councils together are are advancing. Promoting access to quality wreck fishing opportunities. So, you know, you can't have recreational fisheries if anglers don't know about the opportunities or can't access the resource. And, and again, we sought to directly acknowledge this linkage in the policy um, in terms of promoting uh, access. You know, the agency has done a fair amount of, of work on this, for example, so sort of photo contests. We've done a number of national photo contests uh, with Bonnier Corporation, which owns Saltwater, Sportsman, Sport Fishing Magazine, et cetera. We've worked with both the private sector uh, and other federal agencies promoting um, participating in National Fishing and Boating Week each year. Groups like the Recreational Boating and Fishing Foundation, National Marine Manufacturers, ASA, et cetera. Um, we sponsored numerous sort of take a kid fishing type and other family friendly events. Um, the Hispanic Access Foundation is, is one program that we work with up in Massachusetts. Uh, and, and we also had a fair amount of um, uh, work we've, in terms of developing videos highlighting recreational fishing opportunities around the So coordinating with state and management and uh, federal management entities. So while it's cliche to say, I think we all understand that we are all in this together and the policy recognizes that the, the uh, surest path to success is coordinating with our management partners, be they state or federal. And in terms of coordinating with partners, I think the easiest thing to point to, at least from my personal work is uh, are the summits. Uh, we had all the councils participating at the summits. We had the commissions. Uh, we co-sponsor the summits with the Atlantic states. Gulf states was on commission, was on the steering committee. Um, and so it's it's been a great partnership. Uh, in addition, you know, we work with Department of Interior now on the Sport Fishing and Boating Partnership Council. That is a uh, federal advisory committee, which has now become advisory to the Secretary of Commerce uh, newly, in addition to the Secretary of Interior. Uh, so that's a, a that's a new uh, effort. And now with the, the newly established uh, Federal Interagency uh, Committee on Outdoor Recreation, also known as FICOR, uh, we're coordinating with numerous other federal agencies. Oops. We lost slide number four somehow. Is this what happens? Yeah, okay. We did, okay. Um, well, slide number four was advancing innovative solutions, which is an area where I think there's a need that goes beyond simply identifying a solution, but then extends to helping advance that innovation. And, and an easy example there is Barrow Trauma. Um, you know, we sponsored a series of workshops around the country, which uh, helped spark development of the, the sequelizer. The, the guys who did that came to the workshops and walked away and developed that product. Um, Bycatch catch hotspot mapping is something which the councils are using more and more frequently. Uh, 
And certainly this morning, while it's not rec specific, the ropeless gear conversation is certainly uh, an area where um, in innovative solutions are being developed and and fielded. Oops. So now to five. Scientific, providing scientifically sound and trusted information and for a science-based agency, this is a, a, a pretty uh, core uh, necessity, right? And what we've realized is one of the best ways to both get good, solid data and uh, build trust and partnership is through collaboration. And that was one of the key messages that we heard uh, at this year's summit. And it's an approach that we really actively pursue uh, for example, as we came out of the summit or during the summit, we heard uh, about data gaps on the West Coast with Pacific rockfish species, species uh, quailback and copper rockfish. We were able to quickly work with the with the Southwest Center uh, and a, um, an association of charter boats out on the West Coast to set up a sampling program for those species down in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, there was a lot of interest in trying to collect some climate related information um, and water quality information relating to harmful algal blooms. And we were able to partner up with some fishermen down there, provide sensors to take water quality readings. And now that's being fed into different climate models and have models. So this is a place where we really see a lot of uh, space for greater collaboration. Six, communicating and engaging with the public. Well, this is something that's always critical, can always be improved and something that federal agencies tend to not do particularly well, but it is an area where we, we spend a lot of time. Again, uh, summits and various regional roundtables uh, that we've been hosting, GARFO has, has certainly held a series of those led by Maura Kelly on different ways of sort of aligning regulations uh, with, um, timelines of, of fisheries, um, production of wreck fishing videos. There was, there's been a lot of interest in trying to shift to a greater video format. And it is, is it is something that during COVID we really were uh, re recognized we had to do in order to engage. And so we're developing more and more videos that are up on, on screen or up on, on the web, um, supporting the MREP, the MREP program. Uh, which, it, as you all well know, engages both commercial and rec anglers is something which which we as a program and, and the agency as a whole has made a substantial commitment to. And so it is something that we are working on actively and are always trying to uh, improve. So I'm going to turn it over to Sean to talk to touch base on what we've been hearing the last Thanks, thanks, Russ, um, and thank you for having us. Yeah, um, my name is Sean Morton. I'm going to kind of go through some of the comments that we've been receiving to date. I uh, want to emphasize that, that um, and we'll, we get to this at the end. The comment period is going to be open until December 31st, and uh, give you a sense of the things that, that have been coming in or we've been hearing at some of the various meetings. Climate change is, has been um, a big one. Climate resilient fisheries has, has definitely been identified as something that's missing from this policy. And so uh, we're, we're, we're hearing more and more about that. Um, it, it, it's important to address vertical migration. We've been hearing comments on that. Um, uh, marine spatial planning and like balancing ocean uses, that, that's been coming up. Uh, more and more discussions about things like wind farms and uh, aquaculture and marine sanctuaries, all in kind of uh, the same locations and, and comments about it. maybe the policy needs to address uh, something like that and, 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 and how best to do that. Uh, we've been hearing about more education, um, uh, increasing uh, the NOAA fisheries presence, um, getting people out to uh, the regions, getting them out to fishing clubs, talking to folks uh, on social media, much, much higher uh, level of engagement uh, at, at the regional level. Um, been hearing about um, a lot about data collection and use. Um, this, this is, we've had multiple comments, and I think at almost every meeting, 
about improving data, but, um, particularly for um, recreational fishermen that, that aren't reporting it right now and how best to use fishermen to get more data to make better decisions on the management end. So that, that's been a very common theme uh, as we've been going around to different groups. Uh, promoting public access, uh, you know, we, we do have that as one of the principles now, but we that we've heard about how access needs to come with a price uh, and, and that, that it has to be reported. Um, so as you increase public access, as you encourage more people into recreational fishing, you've got to make sure that that, that gets reported, uh, particularly for federal waters. Um, we've had comments about an easy permit. Um, you know, multiple comments for different different angles for a, a federal license or possibly a boat permit. Um, then uh, a lot of comments about again citizen science and uh, collaborative research, ways to get recreational fishermen involved um, on their own through through citizen science, but also through um, uh, targeted collaborative research. And Russ, I think, mentioned a couple. Of, Different examples that we started with, um, but that that continues to be something that we've heard from from Hawaii all the way uh, out to the East Coast. So, um, we, we have heard about uh, enforcement. It's up there. Uh, enforcement is uh, also as an as an outreach mechanism. Uh, some enforcement people will hear about it, uh, and it's a way to way to uh, make sure people are following the rules. Uh, so some some comments about enforcement. Equity, environmental justice, access, um, you know, everything from, you know, modifying terminology on, on fishermen to include just people who fish, including uh, indigenous people, um, access as an equity environmental justice issue, uh, that's been coming up. Um, then, and then certainly we've been hearing comments about depredation, conservation, discards, uh, discard reporting, um, and Getting those addressed either through uh, at the high level of the policy or, or how it's implemented, and then we've been hearing about uh, you know fish specific issues. So these are the um, these are the kinds of things we've been hearing about. Certainly want to uh, hear more from from your council, um, and we're going to try and get those uh, comments up so people can see them and and maybe better inform and sharpen up the comments as they come in towards the end of the year. You can go to the next slide. Oh, uh, sorry. Okay, I got that. Um, so, and uh, so the next steps in, in terms of gathering up more comments. Again, we are. Uh, it's going to be open until the, the December thirty first. We've got several more in person virtual sessions. We, we're going around to um, not just the councils, but uh, targeted uh, constituent meetings, uh, different groups, and. Know of someone that wants to hear from us, we we be open to getting even more. Um, I know some folks around the table have probably heard this three or four times, maybe even more. Uh, maybe <laughs> uh, so. There's certainly, some familiar names is coming up. So uh, we we do have uh, uh, another uh, public webinar coming up in November 16th. That's a generally open for anybody, um, and then yeah, we all have copies of this. Uh, presentation. We've got the QR codes up there. Um, it's on our website, and also have a, a new uh, email to take public comment, and that's recreational. Dot fisheries at noaa. Dot gov, um, and I think that's going to be up and up on the website soon. So that's recreational. Dot fisheries at noaa. Dot gov. Um, um, this brings us back to the general discussion questions. Um, again, in terms of process, um, we absolutely welcome individual comments, but um, we certainly do want to hear from the council as a whole. That's always a strong message in terms of gathering comments. This is informal, uh, a little more informal than a regulatory process. Uh, so we do take, you know, we take notes throughout this. Um, certainly, have, like to have a letter. By To Eric, who has had to sit through this four times, we're going to draft him in to, uh, to uh, craft the new policy. <laughs> uh, 
Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Russ. Uh, any council member have any questions for these gentlemen? Joe Semino. Thanks, Russ. Um, so, Russ, I haven't given you a heads up on this yet, so uh, <laughs> I, I don't expect an answer now. Um, and I hope that we can have a, a, a more broad discussion about it at the state director's meeting. You know, one of the things that this council is trying to tackle is sector separation. To some extent, we'll have to close some regulatory gaps for state waters, but mandatory uh, VTR reporting. Um, and so I am curious if, you know, if, if you believe that there could be a transition to something other than just the, the typical MRF estimates and so, you know, a, a validation process for the VTRs that's, that's something different and moving forward in that, um, using that for management. And so I, I'm, I'm particularly interested in doing that at the state directors meeting. You know, the Gulf Coast is, and, and other states have kind of moved towards that process. But, you know, just thinking about what that means for, for the Mid-Atlantic and for the Atlantic in general. Yeah, so, uh, you know, I don't want to delve too deeply into MRIP because I am not the, the statistical expert, but I, but I will say this, that there are currently uh, high-level discussions in the agency, leadership-level discussions with MRIP, really trying to step back and craft a new um, sort of strategic plan, five-year plan. And, and there is a, a tremendous amount of interest in uh, ground-truthing the effort estimates uh, that, are, that are out there from our uh, science centers and our, our regions. Uh, and so that is certainly a, an interesting concern that, that we are acutely aware of. And um, our science, uh, Office of Science and Technology Director, Evan Howe, is working on this um, along with a, a number of us trying to address that and other questions. Julie Helmerick. Thank you, and I've, uh, this is the third time that I've heard this, and I hope my comments are following behind every time I've commented on it. Uh, having thought about this and seeing, seeing this three times, one thing uh, I've come to realize that there's some different definitions that might be added for access, catch and release, and catch and fish. And how I say access is during any closed season or weather opportunity, somebody can go fishing and catch and release fish. There's nothing to stop them from having access. Access uh, means that the industry, whether it's a tackle industry, bait industry, or something, is is um, you know selling tr uh, selling motors, selling boats, and that access is different than catch and release fishery and um, catching fish. And something that I see just from my experience with HMS as liaison and also in the South Atlantic is these rare event species uh, are, are having to get, need a better understanding besides something from, besides Emirat. And you have PSCs that are through the roof uh, I believe this year, and I might be wrong, somebody, uh, uh, I thought I read somewhere where if they're over 50%, they're not going to publish them. And, and, and so that just, you know, this access to this resource has got to come at a price to pay for, for accounting for it. And, um, <laughs> you know, it's something that uh, the recreational industry needs to look at as a whole because it is not, it is not a, a, a for commercial fishing. It gets shut down. You're not going out there for catch and release, fun fishing, or something like that. So it's a little different. But it needs to be looked at. And, and these, uh, uh, the way we are accounting for the catch uh, in some of these things it, it is, it's got to be better. And when you have PSEs that are so high that management says you shouldn't be using them, and you use them. I just it just baffles me, and there's no policy that I know of to date, uh, besides maybe some smoothing that that will affect that uh, when when numbers are so high and spike. But 
the general policy that you started out with in 2015 um, was kind of like an umbrella, and now it's getting better defined. But at that price, people want more, more, more. But you know, there ain't so much pie out there, and uh, a better understanding of your access, catch and release, and catching uh, needs to be uh, uh, a little more understood because uh, it has an effect. And so I hope my comments have stayed the same through all three times I commented. Thank you. Michelle Duvall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks, Russ, for the presentation and for, you know, I am a first time listener of this presentation, so it's all nice and crisp and fresh for me. But I was I was glad to hear you mention um, subsistence or, or non commercial fishing. I mean, I, I was fortunate to be able to serve on the National Academies committee that, you know, examined management uh, and data for recreational fisheries. And that was something that we heard a lot about from, you know, the Western Pacific in particular, but just recognizing that, you know, I mean, and this is the this is the challenge in trying to manage recreational fisheries is that there are so many motivations, but there, you know, there's a real, um, you know, there are folks who certainly bristle at being called recreational fishermen because they're not in it for the fun; they're in it to feed themselves and to feed their family. So I think you know, recognizing that you know within the policy or or the objective somewhere would be. Valuable, and then you know this. My second <clears throat> comment really builds on you know what Joe and Dewey have already said, and I think it speaks to the you know your current guiding principle about advancing innovative solutions. And so, I'm glad to hear about the conversations for a five-year strategic plan. You know, at the leadership level with staff of the Emirat program, because I think there were a lot of recommendations from the National Academy study to try to enhance you know the the baseline and the long-standing um, time series that MRIP has already built and there certainly have been improvements to the survey you know and broad recognition that it's not it can't be everything for every species um, but there were a lot of recommendations within that report of how you know the current survey could be enhanced to try to improve the precision of estimates to address some of those rare event species and to to look at things like outliers and so i'm i'm hopeful I, you know i know that you're not the emirate program but there's there's certainly close coordination and i think that's necessary um, to try to you know build some of this trusted um trust in the information and you know, incorporating some of those recommendations, I think would be key to that. Thank you. Adam Nawalski. Good afternoon, thank you very much. Uh, so Dewey commented that the 2015 policy was similar to an umbrella and now we're looking for better definition. And let me just say that I think that the goals and principles that were introduced in 2015 have in certain parts of the country, and particularly here in the mid-Atlantic with regards to conservation in particular, have largely been met. Uh, you know, I was sat before this council before I was a council member and implored uh, the regional administrator at the time in this council to highlight the successes in management that the mid-Atlantic has had. Um, what we've seen since that time in a lot of cases is those successes have now generated a lot of challenges uh, for us with regards to access, with regards to discard mortality, uh, with regards to questions about MRIP. Uh, I think these are better challenges to have than the challenge of not having a resource to access, thankfully, but we need to do better with them. So my question revolves around what I think the policy may need to move towards is the way Magnuson has national standards that were written into the law, but then have had guidelines that have been developed and are essentially living changes to that document. Uh, and it's really those guidelines that drive a lot of what we do now. Uh, so I was wondering your thoughts about in modifying the goals or the principles 
or is there a way to move forward with some more of that definition Dewey talked about through something that was more defined than just the principles that would be more akin to the guideline standards relationship that Magnuson has? You know, I, I guess I would say probably. Uh, I can't answer that definitively. I, I think certainly there are ways to to address uh, some definitional issues. However, in order for it to them to have sort of regulatory weight, it would need to be go through a, a more formal process through the national standard guidelines or um, uh, otherwise be incorporated into the federal regs in, in some way to give those definitions weight. Um, but it's certainly something that, you know, we are happy to look at and, and consider uh, as they come in and in, in, in comment from the councils. Yeah, sorry, I, I don't know. I, 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 that doesn't seem like a very satisfactory answer, but I guess I'm struggling a little bit with the underlying question of, of can we can we better define things in the policy? Sure, to some degree, but then in order to give it real weight, those definitions would have to be amended in, in through the, the uh, through regulatory action. So I'll try a little better to define the question instead of speaking more with the umbrella, which thankfully looking outside, we don't seem to need this afternoon, which is an improvement over the last six days. Um, the policy as it stands right now is constituted by uh, the guiding principles, is constituted by uh, moving upwards, is constituted by the policy goals, has the scope, has the policy statement. Those are the four elements of the REC policy. I think what I'm suggesting is could the policy be is there an openness to further developing the policy to have another level that's more defined than just the policy? Or are you really looking to just stop with the questions of how do we change the policy guiding principles? How do we change the policy goals? How do we change the policy and the policy statement? I think what I'm suggesting is the overall rec fisheries policy needs to have a better level of definition at another level beyond the policy. Okay. Yeah, and, yeah. and is that something that would be open in the comment process sure. and could have further development? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Now I have a better sense of what you're saying. So, uh, yes, across, uh, yes, across the board. So it's certainly something we're open to is, is, is uh, adjusting the format and the, uh, uh, the structure of the policy. Absolutely. That's at, sort of, it's all on, on the table. Uh, in terms of getting a little bit more granular, if you will, I mean, I what the way uh, the important part I think of the policy is not necessarily the policy itself, but the follow through and implementation of it. Uh, and to get to that uh, aspect, what we expect to do uh, at this point is to once we have a finalized policy. We'll then push it out to the regions for regionalized implementation. And when I say region in this case, it's a more of a NIMS geographic region. So in, in the Northeast, it would be the center and the regional office, uh, Garbo, uh, and the Mid-Atlantic. So yes, uh, we are open to that idea of, of adding or adjusting the structure. And, and trying to get more definition or more granular. And then in terms of follow through that, there'll be some level of, I'll say national program office follow through. And then in addition to that will be uh, the regional implementation plans. Is that more helpful? Any more questions? Seeing none, thank you, Russ. Thank you, Sean. Thanks, and I would just encourage the council as a whole and individuals to uh, 
comment on the policy through the through the website. We've got a portal as well as, that's in the in the presentation, as well as the email address, which we've added. And I didn't have update in this. All right, hang on one second before you leave. I think Greg, do you have a question or a comment? Yes, please. I, I'll be brief. I know you're trying to stay on track. Greg DiDomenico, Lunds Fisheries. Uh, Russ, just a question, and perhaps also to the council as well, um, as they uh, react to this policy. Um, the issue of access from the people that you heard from in the numerous meetings and discussions you've had. Um, are they talking about literally access, as in getting chased off of beaches, losing access? Uh, for 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 that type of fishing, or are they talking about something else? I'll start, and then you you finish. Um, all of the above. Uh, we have had access raised from multiple perspectives, uh, be it as an equity issue or physical access from uh, shoreside infrastructure needing improvements or updating, particularly down like uh, in Florida when when all the Piers get wiped out, things like that. Um, to see, like open season and uh, availability of of fish. If a migratory pattern changes, how are we going to adjust and ensure access? So really, it's the sort of the all facets of the concept that you can uh, think of. We've we've heard about. Yeah, and I'll I'll, I'll just add it, it. It is infrastructure. We also lost piers in South Carolina, um, and. Just one, uh, though. No, but, uh, but it will also um, one of the access has also meant access to, to management and access to, to the people that are, that are having the conversations about managing uh, recreational fisheries and, and, and making sure that, that the managers come to the people who are fishing. So it, it was, it's, it's another part of access is just access to the world of, of managing uh, resources. Um, and and making sure that people th those people that are managing the resources come out and and to see the resource itself to understand the challenges that are going on and that that's been happening in an uneven way around the country so we've referred that on both coasts and the gulf um, as well as out in hawaii that's consistent okay I'm, I'm i'm glad to hear you guys talk about it in that manner because i've heard now on two or three meetings people try to cloud the issue of access with allocation and um, I personally, um, you know, having just been through the allocation issue, um, I think that's uh, been meted, meted out fairly. Um, but I just want to make sure that um, those two are kind of separate and that if people are going to say that allocation is about access and access is about allocation, is that just a complaint about their bag size and season? Because if it is, I mean, you know, bag size and seasons are what they are. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that um, that your policy reflects that access is sort of the physical issues and not 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 claiming that uh, access uh, has been hindered through their allocations because I I think that would be a bit of a stretch. Thank you. And certainly, just just for clarity, certainly that is is one um, interpretation of access by some of the folks who commented. But as as we said, we're hearing about hearing about it in the very broad. Uh, definition of the term. Any more questions or comments from the audience? Thank you again for presenting. Our next agenda item will be on, we're going to receive an update on recreational tile fish permitting and reporting. Uh, there will be no council action needed for this. We'll just be getting an update. John Sullivan and Doug Potts or GARCFO will be remotely doing the meeting, and then council staff Hannah and Jose will be here to answer questions and give a presentation as well. Uh, do we need a couple minutes to get set up? Nope, we're ready. To, okay, who's going to be presenting first? Uh, I believe John Sullivan should be on the webinar. Yep, John Sullivan is here. All right, John, we All are right. ready. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is John Sullivan. I'm a statistician up at Garfo, and my colleague Doug Potts and I are just here to give you guys uh, a quick update on the recreational tilefish permits program. If we get the next slide, please. 
Uh, just as an overview, uh, this program started in 2020 and the first permits were issued in August of that year. Uh, this gives a, a third option for tilefish permits other than party charter permits and commercial tilefish permits. To date, uh, 1,170 vessels have been issued recreational tilefish permits. Of those vessels, um, 167 recreational trips have reported uh, have been reported. 167 recreational tilefish trips have been reported through BTRs, uh, and recreational tilefish trips have reported uh, 1,161 pounds of tilefish catch. If we get the next slide. Uh, this table is just showing the uh, amount of tilefish landed by year. Uh, first column. This is this is the calendar year. I should say everything we're all the, everything we're presenting today is on a calendar year basis. Uh, the first column is tilefish catch on recreational tilefish trips with an active recreational tilefish permit, and and you can see the number of fish caught has increased. Uh, it was a big jump from the first year the program was offered, uh, and then a steady increase since then. The second column we were kind of trying to look at if there's potential for any issues with uh, reporting or confusion on the report. So this is tilefish catch on recreational trips that don't have an active recreational tilefish permit. Uh, the first couple of years we're seeing a little bit kind of, I think, more issues with this. This past year in 2022, uh, I think all of the the tilefish caught on rec trips that didn't have a rec permit uh, were with vessels who had a permit pending and the permit came online, usually within sometimes a day or two of when the fish were caught. Uh, and then that last column, we just took a quick look to see if there were any uh, cases where tilefish were caught on party charter trips, but only had recreational permits. And we did find a few of those happening. Uh, this could just be a, an issue of people not filling out their BTRs wrong or not, not understanding the difference between a rec and a party charter trip. We can have the next slide. Uh, now we're looking at uh, private recreational tilefish permits issued by year. In that first column, we've got the total number of permits issued in each calendar year since the program started. Uh, in the second column, the number of first time permits or vessels that hadn't had a recreational tilefish permit before. So we can see is that the number of vessels applying for these permits has been increasing since the program started, uh, although we have seen some permits dropping out, like the, the number of initial permits is not just the the increase in total permits issued, it's more than that. So there are some permits who are applying one year, some vessels who are applying one year and not following year. We have the next slide. Uh, this is recreational tile fish permits that also hold other types of tile fish permits. Uh, and these are uh, other permits that are held by the same boat within the same calendar year. They don't necessarily overlap, but so uh, the first column is the number of tile fish permits issued each year to give you kind of a sense of the, the universe of permits we're talking about. And then the number that also had party charter tilefish permits or commercial tilefish permits. And there's a big chunk that also had commercial permits, uh, kind of a smaller number have tend to have party charter permits in addition to their rec permits. We have the next slide. Uh, <clears throat> this is the number of permits who have caught tilefish in a given year. Uh, the first column again is the number of permits issued. The next is the number of vessels who have caught tilefish on while holding an active recreational tilefish permit. And the, the last column is the number who have caught tilefish with an active recreational tilefish permit on a trip that's been declared as a recreational trip. So there are some vessels who uh, may have a, a recreational permit who are catching tilefish, but on either commercial trips or party charter trips. But a lot of the vessels who are catching tilefish are doing so on recreational trips. Go to the next slide. And this is looking at the uh, fishing activity by number of vessels per year and also the number of trips that those vessels have taken. So we're uh, looking at the number of uh, vessels with an active recreational tilefish permit who report fishing activity in a given year. That's the, the middle column there. Uh, next up is the number of vessels with active recreational tilefish permits uh, who are reporting having taken recreational trips and then uh, the number that have reported taking recreational trips and landed uh, tilefish on those trips. And then in the, the second table underneath, it's just kind of the same numbers, except instead of the number of vessels taking these trips and landing tilefish, it's the number of trips that were taken by those said vessels. So you can see uh, 
landings have been up since the program started, kind of pretty consistently since since the beginning of the program. Uh, and I think next up question is Doug. Did you have anything to add about outreach? Or? Yes. Sorry. I, I hope you can hear me. Um, I'm just I'm just jumping on uh, this last slide. I don't have any slides of my own. Just to add a little more sort of the less analytical aspects of the program on this. Um, and since the update we gave the, the council at last October's council meeting, uh, I just want to mention that the sort of the primary focus of the regional EVTR outreach sort of efforts and remind the council is that it's been the expansion to all commercial vessels, that that, that was a very big thing that happened sort of last November, and there was an awful lot of outreach before and after and, and pairing into it. And so that, uh, particularly the case last winter and, and spring, became sort of the big focus and a lot of the uh, staff effort went into that expansion into commercial fishing. And so that was one of the reasons why there was a little less focus on doing outreach for the reptile fish permitting and reporting uh, going into the 2022 fishing year than we had the year before um, is you know, a lot of that effort on the commercial fleet. Um, this year, after this council meeting, uh, we'll, I'll be meeting with, with some of the Garfo colleagues in the coming weeks, and we're gonna develop plans for you know, the messaging and outreach that we'll be conducting ahead of the 2023 fishing season and actually throughout that fishing season. Um, we'll be including in our communications teams or port agents, probably enforcement as well, um, just to talk about what, what we can do and plan for this. And I was I was able last week to listen in on the joint AP meeting, and I think uh, Council staff will talk about that probably in a minute. Um, and, and I found the discussion in that group was, was very valuable uh, and gave some very good perspective on, on some of these questions. And I'm, I'm looking forward to using some of the suggestions coming out of that meeting as we plan to uh, to update in our web pages and move out with our messaging going forward for this, so there's more outreach to do and more uh, efforts that we can uh, we, we can do to try to increase uh, if there's a compliance problem, but make sure that there's there's not in this fishery. So that was all I wanted to add on at the end of John's uh, other presentation. Thank you. And I think we're both ready to take any questions. Yeah. Am I right? Uh, thank you for your presentation. For me, it's kind of confusing, uh, but that's probably just me. Can you go back to page one or two of your slide presentation where it had to do with the amount of fish? It, it is that's reported in pounds, correct? Oh, I'm I'm sorry, that's that isn't correct. That should be number of fish, 1,161 fish. Okay. And um, do you have a, I guess you don't have a breakdown by which state, uh, you know, uh, is catching the fish and reporting, because there's definitely a compliance problem or issue that needs compliance assistance to further outreach. Um, and that might would be helpful in your uh, presentation in the future is to put, you know, Unless it's a confidentiality thing, uh, because it's you know you can see more on social media uh, the numbers than you do uh, in these reports, and I realize that it takes time to get there, but uh, th th this is very lacking in the compliance part of it, uh, given it's been uh, almost two years since its implementation, and I would hope that the additional outreach that's going to be done could be focused outreach. And maybe even looking at social media posts by enforcement for compliance assistance to go track that down that you have that ability to with the name of the boat or something like that to see if they actually complied. But do provide that compliance assistance and not write tickets, uh, you know, maybe for another year until you all determine it, it's needed. But uh, thank you for your report. But I would hope in the future you, you could segment it out more, particularly by states that have reported uh, uh, the vessels from that state, the vessels that didn't report and things like that might would be helpful in the future. Thank you. Lieutenant Commander Matt Cayley. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair, and uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, can you go back to slide uh, six, please? I had a question, uh, looks like it's trending up uh, from 2020 to 21, and then even continuing up to 2022 there with the permits issued and active, um, active permits from the, the data that you've gathered. So I was trying to get a sense if that's related to COVID or um, 
kind of the reason for the almost doubling there um, with the permit on the slide. I think that the, one of the big reasons that the program started in 2020 and didn't start until I think it was uh, first promise were issued in August of 2020. So they're kind of everything was kind of getting off the ground and vessels were hearing about this and finally first getting their permits. And then kind of we've continued to, as our outreach has continued, we've had more and more people join into the program in the full fishing years. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Scott Lennox. Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I'd just like to uh, expand on Dewey's comments briefly. In my state in Maryland, um, I'd love to see these by state. In my state in Maryland, we, you know, we only have one access point to the ocean uh, as far as tile fishing is concerned. So our, our port, uh, that folks that aren't fishing from the Chesapeake Bay, that's kind of a hike. Uh, but most folks are coming back into and leaving from Ocean City Inlet. And I do a fishing report every night where we report on offshore fish and tile fish is a big part of what the guys catch when they're on tuna fishing trips that don't produce. So I would probably, I won't guarantee, but I would probably guess that I have more tile fish in my fishing report uh, than were reported by a long shot. So if I could do some comparison between what was actually reported in Maryland um, and what I even have in my fishing report, I think we'll see a large discrepancy there. Thanks. Any more questions for Doug or John? Oh, Adam Nowoski. I think this question may actually go to the Lieutenant Commander, but it's on this topic of, is there any active Coast Guard enforcement of this issue of the permitting? And what is the encounter rate? And what are, what are you finding offshore with regards to this? Um, familiar with your little species guide, you know, that's tremendously helpful. Are tile fish now in there? Do all boarding officers know that if they board somebody offshore recreational to be looking for this permit? And, you know, what, what are you seeing there that complements the NOAA reporting? Uh, sure, and uh, thank you for the comment. Thank you for the question. Um, I would say, I don't have the, the boarding numbers in front of me on how many vessels that we boarded this year um, that have had tile fish on board. Um, but we historically what we've seen just in the wreck fishery is the lack of permits um, that folks that we, we board their vessel they'll have they won't have the permits um, they aren't aware of them um, depending on if there's a reporting requirement so for example like bluefin tuna that has a 24-hour reporting requirement we'll advise them that they need to kind of report but for uh, tailfish specifically um, you know, we're looking at the permits we're looking at the the size based off of what the regs say um, Aside from that, I don't, I don't have a ton of information on the, on the tile fish, but it is something that, you know, our, our folks do see when they do boardings. It's just not as frequent as probably HMS, um, depending on kind of the, you know, the time of year and what we're seeing out there in terms of the wreck fishery. Anyone from the audience or online have a question? And just to follow up, you know, the South Atlantic Council has been talking about the Mid Atlantic Council's tilefish reporting uh, quite a few times here in the last couple of meetings. But they also asked about the compliance rate. You know, are we getting data out of it? And uh, I, I think that the ability for GARFO and, and outreach maybe this year could be a, a uh, you know, like the first, uh, not the first, but uh, like some excessive outreach in, in getting maybe compliance up there because uh, for these particular species that are false fisheries or rare event at Emmerich would say, it, it, it's needed to get that data. Uh, it's needed to see what's catching. And a lot of this catching has to do uh, also with HMS fisheries that if you're not catching something, you could drop on the bottom. And something like that, but so it would also, you know, this is the first tallfish. This is the first recreational reporting, my knowledge, uh, on the East Coast rec reporting permit. And so, as being the first, it, it, it's to us in this council to follow up with some uh, quality and also Garfo quality outreach, if possible, because it could be. For other people to use because it's needed in in other parts of the country along the Atlantic. 
some type of reporting like this. So thank you. Yeah, something that I noticed too, like at Indian River, uh, we got one fish cleaner basically that comes in Indian River. If the outreach could reach out even with something as simple as a poster board, you know, covered up in vinyl, you know, covered up just to say to guarantee or you know, make sure you do report. Because I've asked, you know, some of the fishermen that land, did you report? And they just pretty much just laugh at you. So I know the numbers, there's no way they could be correct. But I don't know if the outreach could basically you got a couple fish cleaners in Lewis, one in Indian River, but not there's not too many in handful in Ocean City. And you know, most people don't clean fish anymore. They oh, it's worth it to them to pay somebody to do it. I don't know if something without reach could work that way or not. Dan Farnham. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you know, in the commercial sector, um, if you don't catch anything, you have to do a negative report. Is there any thought of, of requiring a negative report through the VTR system to renew your permit? Doug or John or Jose, do you want to take this one? Well, I, I was just going to say, I, I'm, I, we require negative reporting. Now, I don't know if that's a prerequisite to get your, your permit the following year if you don't report. But, but you are supposed to report uh, negative uh, landings. Quick follow up. It might, be, it might be something to consider. I mean, if, if, if you can't renew your permit without getting into the VTR system to file a negative report, at least it teaches people how to access that. That system, and then then they know how to how to file you know a landing report too. So it might be something to consider going forward. Uh, if this is Doug Potts, I might just jump in. Um, I think as what Jose may have been referring to is is uh, a a negative report, sort of a report for a trip that did not catch any fish. Um, what we we don't require right now is a a did not fish report. You know those are the things that we used to require all the commercial fishers as well. We we did away with that a number of years ago. Uh, and we did not implement that for the reptile fish to have a, a did not fish report, though I have heard um, a few people recommending that. And that is one thing, something I think we're going to look into or talk about. But um, I think that that might have come up last week at the New England Council meeting, too. Um, we, we were very careful to get rid of it for commercial. And I'm not sure we want to rush to get take it, you know, to recreate it for recreational. But it is uh, something to think about. Scott Lennox. Mr. Vice Chair, I think one of the problems is the, is the fact that uh, recreational anglers um, in our area don't have to report many of their species. Tile fish and a couple of tunas, um, but most of the time um, their, their fish are uh, collect, data collected with intercept surveys rather than have to report them themselves. Um, if, if with, back to Wes's comments on outreach, maybe we could take it, not we, but um, the agency could take advantage of local fishing reports and um, places that have popular Facebook and Instagram accounts at different ports and things like that. I know I know I put on my fishing report um, a couple of times a year that the man, it's mandatory reporting for tile fishing that you have to have a permit whether people take advantage of, of that information and follow through with it is, is completely up to them. But maybe there's some sort of um, database of different places in, in different ports uh, that could get the information out. Thanks. Any further comments? Oh, go ahead, Ken. It's Ken Neal. Um, two comments I got from my recreational fishing centers to open up sea bass. They want us to report blue line tile fish catches. They have to make it simple. Pay for, a, for and for, we do have reporting requirements for bluefin tuna and for forever. Swordfish is another thing which we have to report them. Um, the, the data is not used because compliance is low. Um, and so, but that that's the comment I've, I've got. And it, the process of, of getting the permit reporting uh, is complicated and. Awkward and and I know when the first time I got the permit and 
2020, it was a mess. Uh, a 2022 permit was much easier to get. Um, we are, I'm from Virginia. We had our own uh, codfish permitting and reporting. And we were used to that and easy and simple and, and same thing we do with Kobe and the same thing we do with sea bass fishery. Um, but the federal system was, was more complicated. So th those are the comments I've, I've received from the public. Thank you. Thank you. Ironically, we did away with our pitch and use tile fish reporting requirement because of this federal program. So, um, you know, I think compliance in this is very low. And if, if our data would help in any way, we'd be willing to provide that. But we've stopped with, I guess it was 2000 was the last year we did it. One thing I will say about the EVTR, uh, I'm computer alert. I figured out how to do it. So, and the support system, uh, if I've ever had a problem, I've called them up. It's been 930 on a Saturday night. Somebody answers the phone and can walk me right through it. So, so far, the EVTR program so far, I think, is working at least on the commercial side. Any more questions? All right, we'll continue the presentation with Hannah and Jose. Yeah, so thank you. So as indicated, we wanted to provide an update on some of the outreach and communication done um, so far, as well as a summary of a recent AP meeting we held between our tilefish and our communication and uh, outreach and communication advisory panels, and then some ideas for additional outreach and communications moving forward. So this slide just summarizes the outreach efforts um, accomplished by the council and GARFO um, to date. Uh, this is not uh, an exhaustive list by any means, um, but just to highlight a couple things. So. A number of outreach materials have been created, including flyers, rack cards, posters, and tabletop displays. And those have been distributed at fishing shows as well as um, other events attended by port agents. Um, and then rack cards have been distributed to um, a suite of tackle shops within the region as well as interested stakeholders. Um, there has also been several announcements made related to these regulations. Um, in the NOAA um, Navigator, as well as Fisheries Bulletin, and then several email announcements to both Council and GARFO listservs. Um, there have been another, a number of trainings available as well, um, including a Council-hosted training webinar um, that kind of walked you through how to um, report a trip and download the app and stuff like that. And there are demo and video recordings of those online as well. Um, and then FAQs have also been developed um, about these regulations, and all of these materials are posted on a website or on a web page on our council website devoted to these um, permanent reporting requirements. Um, and so, although a number of outreach efforts have been accomplished so far, uh, we continue to hear these concerns about overall awareness and compliance. And so the next couple slides are kind of walk through the summary of that advisory panel meeting we had. Thank you, Hannah. And uh, <clears throat> the summary for this uh, meeting is under tab number nine. And I'm just gonna be highlighting some of the things that came out of, of, out of that meeting. But I was just smiling when I was listening to all the comments that were just being made around the table because the bulk of what you guys were saying was said at that meeting. So uh, it's, it's reinforcing to, to hear that, that's good. So what, one of the first points of discussion was the target audience, how we're gonna reach uh, these individuals that we need to reach. So one of the things that came out of that meeting was that uh, not to try to concentrate on the entire recreational community, but the recommendation was to do a direct outreach to recreational tilefish permit holders and HMS uh, permit holders. So some of the AP members felt that 
since the current recreational uh, permit holders were informed about all the reporting requirements when they uh, apply for their permit, they should be basically aware of the reporting uh, requirements that are needed for this fishery. However, given that tilefish is not a primary species for most anglers, uh, the recommendation was that sustained outreach and reminders might be, might be necessary to, uh, to just remind people that, uh, that they need to comply with their requirements to, uh, for holding a tilefish permit. There was also a recommendation uh, uh, recommended that the council and or GARFO send target information and periodic reminders directly to the permit holders. And they felt that uh, sending friendly remind, reminders on the existing, uh, to the existing tilefish permit holders is, is, is a good way to move forward. One advisor noted that every HMS permit holder is a potential tilefish fishermen and that uh, uh, that outreach should be directed towards uh, the HMS permit holders. There were three recommendations that were made when this discussion was going on. And the first one was that uh, we should highlight uh, tilefish re uh, requirements on relevant HMS uh, pages. Uh, the staff indicated that we have tried to do this before. JSO didn't has been very involved uh, sending emails to HMS to try to uh, have them <clears throat> uh, post all the requirements for tilefish on the HMS page. And he has been working on that for, for a while. Another recommendation <clears throat> was to send emails or mail notices to HMS permit holders directly. And also to add a notice in the relevant HMS publications and outreach products and try to, you know, try to target things like newsletters, list, list servers, and, and social media where HMS uh, 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 things are published. So, and, and, and we talk a little bit about this just, uh, just a minute ago, but th there was a lot of feedback on the existing outreach materials that have been produced for this effort. Um, one of the uh, recommendations was, was that the material needs to be simplified. Many people tune out if they feel, and, and they feel overwhelmed with the information that was presented in those materials. Uh, regarding the, the rack car and the flyers, uh, they indicated that too many acronyms were used. And the language that was used to produce that material was not angler centric. And furthermore, that the uh, reporting instructions were uh, confusing. So this, 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 this was something that was uh, kind of a turn off for, for people. Uh, another recommendation that was that to, we need to better communicate the rationale for reporting requirements and the potential benefit to anglers. So one of the things that was said is that some anglers fear that reporting could lead to future closures in the fishery. They also indicated that there was not a, like a general understanding of why this information is important, that we needed to make a connection between collecting this information and how it's gonna be used for the management of the, of the fishery. It's gonna be used in the stock assessment. Uh, they also indicated that it was very important to let people know that they, when, when they go out on a towel fish uh, trip, uh, if they if they report zero uh, no landings of tilefish, that is that is something that is useful and is important, and we have to do a better job communicating that so people can understand understand how the data is going to be used. They also recommended that the council and or GARFO staff develop new outreach products, incorporating some of this feedback that was given uh, by the AP members. Some additional suggestions were that uh, we should probably delay any major outreach efforts until next spring. <clears throat> and I think that it was kind of something like perhaps we should do it in March when people are applying for the permits. That's when people are applying for HMS permits for the, for the most part. So it will be good for us 
perhaps even look at the data and see when people are applying for those tile fish permits and try to target the outreach at that time so we can uh, maximize uh, our efforts. Then also to consider non-traditional outreach met methods and incentive. Uh, one individual said that perhaps we should have prizes, lotteries, and contests to capture attention. They have seen this in other, in other uh, uh, instances when giving people incentive to uh, report uh, helps uh, uh, gather data. Uh, to utilize social media, media with simple uh, messaging was another, uh, another input. Uh, that we should consider advertising in fishing, pub, uh, fishing uh, publications and ideally with promotion on social media platforms as well. And lastly, that the outreach materials should include QR codes with links that, uh, for more information. So, uh, you know, those little QR codes that you have that you just, just put more than one and then that can direct people to other pages, but also use simple information in those other pages so people, people can digest the information uh, better. Another topic that, that came up uh, during the meeting was uh, the one about enforcement. And uh, some AP members suggested uh, exploring examples in other fisheries and regions where increased enforcement was used to increase uh, compliance. Uh, Another AP member indicated that uh, in New the New Jersey DEP has been posting enforcement stops on social media. I guess that they have a web page, and they recommended that we do something similar for uh, for tilefish. And it seems to be that this is something that that has worked well for them. Uh, lastly, the topic of duplicative re reporting came came uh, came up, and there was a lot of uh, I, I guess we use frustration here, but but what is is I think that's a good term. A lot of people were frustrated with the lack of coordination between reporting system for different permits. Uh, they recommended that a one-stop reporting system will enhance uh, data collection and compliance. Uh, Garfo staff that was present at that meeting indicated that this is this is an ongoing effort uh, from the agency and uh, it's something that they're working on, uh, but no timeline was given uh, regarding when that will be uh, finalized. So Hannah is going to discuss the next step for, for the council to consider. Uh, this information that she's gonna give, be giving you is based on the feedback provided by the AP uh, members during the joint meeting and also um, staff input. Yeah, so this slide really just summarizes a lot of what Jose was um, speaking towards of, that came from that AP meeting. Um, and we met a staff to kind of come up with this next step slide. Um, so some of the things that we could consider moving forward is developing new digital and printable outreach products that incorporate that feedback from the advisory panel. So that increase or that uh, language messaging and, and things like that. Um, we could also send you know, snail mail or email notices to the current recreational tilefish permit holders, reminding them of these uh, reporting requirements. And that too would include that messaging about, you know, the benefits of accurate reporting, um, different resources to, you know, help them to find, you know, what apps to use and how to report a trip um, through links and QR codes as well as messaging that highlights that all trips need to be reported. So these are even trips where no tilefish are caught. Um, and then given the discussion on timing, we could strive to get this mail or email notice out by you know, early spring to align with that increased angler activity offshore. Um, we could also try to work with HMS staff to coordinate outreach to HMS permit holders. So this would include adding information about tilefish permitting reporting requirements relevant, uh, on relevant HMS websites, um, sending an email or mail notice, probably similar to the Tilefish one, um, to HMS permit holders, as well as disseminating information um, 
through other HMS communication channels like newsletters, listservs, and social media accounts. Um, we could also explore the option of advertising in a phishing publication, so both a printed article as well as through their social media accounts. Um, and then, as much as possible, work with our federal and state partners, sea grants, phishing organizations, and others to disseminate this message far and wide. Um, and so there were a number of other topics, as Jose indicated, um, that came up repeatedly throughout the AP meeting that really go beyond the scope of communication outreach. And that was, uh, or that included increased enforcement needs, as well as this idea of one-stop reporting. Um, and as mentioned, this is an ongoing effort that GARFO and the agency are working on, but it might be something that we could, you know, encourage the continued development of. Um, and with that, that concludes our presentation. Billy Hammerick. Thank you for your presentation. And looking at all these slides, it seems like a, a, a lot of uh, need to do list. Uh, I think there's a better way to achieve what we're trying to do here. When a person applies for this permit, they should either have to watch a video or answer a couple questions. Do you know that you have to report? If it says yes, they go on. If they say no, then you ask them, will you report? And if they say yes, they go on. And if they say no, they don't get the permit. Because that's the access to get the permits. In project online industry, every two or three years, up three years, I got to go take a class. I'm, I'm allowed to do it online now uh, instead of having to take a day and go in person. Also, I believe to get the HMS angling or charter or something, you got to watch a video for sharks. I can't remember exactly what it is. So we're, we're in, the, we're in that, that realm. So all these other things, <laughs> to me, it's kind of like, I don't know, you're just dancing around because people don't want to report. And so if you make them ask these specific questions, then that already gives them the, the, the permit. It gives a uh, uh, enforcement the opportunity for compliance assistance. Say, hey, you said you, you know this and you didn't report. And you know you had to. And so therefore you don't get the permit. All this other stuff takes a lot of time and resources. Put the onus on the person that's, that is getting the permit and for reporting. And I know that uh, through my reporting process, the numerous steps I got to jump through, I don't see, you know, today's technology with a smartphone. Most time people spend two or three hours on them anyway on their phones. What the heck's a couple few minutes of reporting something? So instead of all these other things on the page, which is great and outreach, why not let's tune it up a little quicker to make them answer a few questions and if they answer the right questions, they go on. And if they don't answer the right questions, make them watch a video or something. And so therefore, that's some of the normal things we've had to do in some of the other uh, regions or for other types of permits of accountability. And this is one because I, I think it's it, outreach and, and, and uh, uh, is a good thing. But there comes a point where folks just, you know, they're like, why should we report or, or something like that, you know? We report we're not going to go fishing because we're showing to catching too many fish or something. But there's got to be a better way of a quicker tune-up than what we in, in your in your outreach and what the AP said. And I think going more direct of asking a few questions is, is a better way, faster, achievable, and it also gets enforcement if they need compliance uh, assistance. As you notice, I said assistance is uh, that's a key word nowadays is uh, um, it gives them a chance to look at the permit and say, hey, well, you answered all these questions. And what's wrong with you didn't, permit, uh, you didn't report? Adam Nowalski. I appreciate Dewey's bringing solutions to the table. Um, and his note on assistance, I'm looking forward to his bringing a solution to food later as assistance <laughs> to us very much. Awesome. I had no doubts about that at all. Um, 
So nowhere in any of the report with the ideas for things to do did I see the terms H uh, SMS or just calling permit holders. Uh, seems to me that with 700 plus permits and 1161 fish, that's a place to start where there's likely non-compliance. So was there any discussion at the AP about just starting calling outreach using SMS for outreach to remind people, give them idea? And if not, is that a potentially viable way forward to get directly in touch with these permit holders? So uh, uh, if Doug Potts is on the line, he could correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't believe we ask for their phone number um, when they apply for the permits. I believe we get their email and their address, but I'm not sure about their phone number. I don't know if Doug's on the line and he can clarify. I am. I, I'm not entirely sure either. I think there is phone number, but I'm not sure we verify if it is a, a landline or a cell number. Um, and uh, so I, not, I don't know if we have uh, messaging capabilities necessarily with with all of our permit holders. But I guess to more directly answer your question, um, that didn't come up during the advisory panel meeting, you know, to actually call people or send text messages. It was mainly, you know, the thought of emailing them or sending actually snail mail. But, uh, yeah, I mean, call me old school dinosaur, whatever you want, but I still respond to people. I. I'm not ashamed to tell you, it's not uncommon for me to let two weeks of mail stack up on yeah. my desk at home and looking around the table, I'm not the only one. Um, maybe there's two weeks of unopened email also, uh, you know, but I can tell you, I get a 978 phone number. I know it's something related to phishing that I probably need to answer when it comes up Gloucester. So um, I would encourage some research into those methods uh, as well. Uh, it would seem to be a, a, we know those people that have, we put racks out, we're just casting a net. Maybe we're reaching people, maybe we're not. But for those 700 plus permit holders, we know there's an interest there. Let's get them all on board first uh, and then use them to spread the message would be, um, again, call it old school, but I know it still works. I know in Delaware, uh, I get a text message at the end of every month, and I also get an email at the end of every month saying the commercial reports have to be in by the end of the month. So, I mean, it, it, it's definitely doable, I would think. Scott Lennox. Uh, thank you. Uh, is, is there any discussion about any future penalty, perhaps, for um, harvesting tilefish without reporting it? I mean, that's the question. And the comment is, um, if you decide to advertise with any fishing publications, I know a guy. David Stormer. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, and thanks to the NOAA Fisheries and Council staff for their presentations. I'm not quite sure who this question is directed to. I think maybe Doug Potts uh, looks like he's still on. Um, but uh, NOAA Fisheries constructed an electronic kind of a no before you go tile fishing infographic that included uh, the permit and reporting requirements and a QR code and web link to the Garfo registration site and asked Delaware to incorporate it in its annual paper and electronic fishing guide, uh, which we did and re we received positive feedback from anglers who weren't uh, previously aware of the requirements. I'm presuming that NOAA Fisheries reached out to all other relevant states and just wondering if you have an idea of the proportion of states that agreed to publish it in their fishing guides or what kind of positive response rate you received. Just from Delaware's perspective, um, our anglers are quite uh, reliant on the fishing guide. So I think the infographic has had a big bang for its buck. Thanks. Uh, I could, uh, <laughs> I don't actually know, unfortunately. I, I don't, I don't know how well it was, uh, how, how widely it was distributed to by different states or, uh, who had it, but I think that is a great feedback to get and uh, something we'll put on the table for possibly, you know, trying to do for this next year. We might be able to take advantage of that and maybe push it to more states to see how it did. That's, that's a good suggestion. Thank you. Paul Reese. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So my idea was going to be um, postcard or email, but I love Adam's thoughts on uh, SMS and phone calls. But 
more pointedly, with 790 permits, that's a good chunk of the people that are doing it, but 26 boats filled out BCRs. So maybe starting in the end of June or July, every two weeks, target every permit that hasn't filed a VTR and say your permit and list the permit number or identify the person has not filed any permit, any VTRs. Just as a reminder that you need to file VTRs for any trips you make. So people, when you look at people personally, they tend to pay attention a little more rather than sending out, you get this, yeah, I got that, everybody got that, it's just a group email. But people look at this or, or text especially and say, they're looking at me, it might get their attention. Thank you. Pat Gear. Thank you, Vice Chair. Um, I just want to try to compare this a little bit to, uh, I'm hearing, we have a COBIA permit in Virginia, in Chesapeake Bay, and we've been doing this for about seven years now, and we've been hearing the same things. Um, we went from a couple couple thousand permits, we're over 11,000 permits now. Our COBIA fishery has just exploded. About 20%, 20 to 25% of those people, once they get that permit, we never hear from them again. No, either they don't report or what we have a requirement, if you don't fish at the end of the year, you have to report no, no activity. Um, some folks don't wanna participate, but they have to, because we have a policy now that says, if you do not report by the deadline, you don't get a permit the next year, which results in two to 3,000 phone calls to our office, legislators calling us, and we've drawn a line in the sand. We said we've had a commissioner and legislators who didn't comply. And we said, no, you can't get a permit. We've drawn a line. Nobody. So about 2,000 people lose their permit for a year each year. Um, folks that aren't complying, they go ahead and they get their permit and they turn around and go back in the system and immediately put no activity. And by law, they're done for the year. They don't have to do a thing. So um, we've had a lot of problems with the system. And it's, it's, uh, I'm hearing the same things around the table where we thought at first we weren't doing enough outreach. We started sending emails and Facebook messages each month. Every, every time we went to a fishing club, we mentioned it. But you're always going to have that minor, strong minority that don't want to report. And they're going to do what they have to to get by. So um, it's just... Uh, if you if you want any any information on that, please call us. You know me or Shannon Madison because we have struggled with this time and time again, and Ken can contest to it as well. That we wanted this, we wanted to do this, we wanted to provide this information, and it's not going to be used in the stock assessment. They've already told us it's you know the the value of the data right now is just pretty much just lengths and weights, and the, that might not be able to be used. So um, just to give you a perspective from you know a, a, a state's been doing this for a number of years. Skip Feller. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, another idea also, and, and I think a lot of it is still, believe it or not, a lot of people don't know they have to have one. There's even a lot of the for hire industry out there that doesn't know the permits that they have to have. Um, another thing is, but, but everybody has to have a fishing license. So if there was some sort of list of you know if you're going to fish for these species like in virginia you have to have a cobia permit if you're going to fish for tile fish you have to have a tile fish permit um that might alleviate some of the people not knowing or being able to use that as an excuse because they all know they have to have a fishing license and that's pretty much everywhere now jason didn't just follow up on our hms communications um, those kind of continue back and forth. I think their main concern is it's not just tile fish that HMS permit holders also need permits for. And kind of where do they draw the line on, um, you know, what other permits are they going to list on their website? You can imagine it's going to get a long list and just people aren't going to look at it. Uh, so um, we kind of continue to have some back and forth with them about what opportunities might exist. But that's their kind of general biggest concern to date of like adding some stuff for tile fish to their website is uh, yes, tile fish and, and, and there's probably a bunch of others. And, um, you know, if they try to end up having a complete list, it's just going to get wrapped around the, around the axle. So um, that's kind of where things stand with that. Eric Reed. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, Mr. Hemmel Wright uh, lied to me about uh, some outreach. Uh, in order to land smooth dogfish, you need a 
shark permit and you have to watch the video and have to get your permit. So that's not widely known. There's not a lot of outreach on it, but there was a vessel that landed in Point Judith and there was some outreach. He had a handful of dogfish, got boarded, and he got a citation for it. And in 15 minutes, the entire port of Point Judith knew they needed a permit for it. So I would suggest maybe a few, instead of prizes, a little outreach with here, you're in violation and everybody on the coast will know about it. It's a pretty simple way to do it. So this, it happens. Ken Neal. Just a couple comments. When, when Pat mentioned the Cobia permit, that was a permit for recreational angling. Uh, this was not a VMRC idea. It was our idea. So that is probably the, been the most enthusiastic reporting requirement that recreational anglers ever had having compliance issues with it. Um, but it is, but you do not get your permit the following year if you don't report. I disagree with you on this VTR being easy. I've been sitting here since you said that trying to report a blue line tilefish report. And you have to do it right. Goes through and it wants soak times and all this other stuff. It does is not applicable. And so it can be made easier. Um, and so I, I do think the reporting needs to be made easier. That's what I'm hearing from the recreational guys. You, know, you commercial guys deal with this stuff all the time. This you know, okay, we don't. And this this is not a simple reporting thing. It's not what it was to begin with. There was an app with some other other thing. This is the VCR we've been added to. But it's not simple. I've been mean, but requiring reporting of no catches is been brought up and that's what we've done in Virginia. Um, so there is, you know, there do need to be some consequences. If you don't, if you want the data, you won't have to have consequences. For not you should try to make it as simple as possible. I'll try and help you walk you through it. I, all right. Maureen Davidson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, my comments are similar to what said before. Thank our commercial fishermen report. And there are consequences. Uh, in New York, we have a state VTR. There are consequences where they pay heavy fines if they fail to report and they fail to explain to us why they didn't report. How far would NINS be willing to go to make sure that people who have these permits report? Find them, take their permit away. Uh, if we are serious about getting the information about letting them have these permits, um, there has to be some serious consequences. And since they're recreational, really taking the license away doesn't necessarily hurt them. If I take away someone's lobster permit or their crab permit in New York, I am hurting them financially because they're commercial fishermen. How do you compel a recreational fisherman to do something that he's doing for fun most of the time? So it's very hard to find something that will compel the ones who don't want to report report. Thank you. Chris Moore. Mr. Uh, Chair, just a quick question. I would have asked this earlier, Jose or Hannah. So now I missed it. Can you go to slide nine real quick, please? What is Posting enforcement stops. So one of the AP members from New Jersey, he said that they're actually like posting, if they stop a boat and oh. they are out of compliance with something, they're posting that enforcement stop and what occurred and what activity occurred during that stop. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Does. Yeah, thank you. The other, uh, the other thing I wanted to mention questions and comments. The, uh, for folks who were here yesterday, you know that this is part of our 2023. So we'll be rolling. If in fact the council agrees that this is important priority in December, we'll continue to work on this. And get a uh, communications plan put together to deal with this particular topic. Uh, several times Jose and Hannah said we, uh, the we is like a royal we. 
because it involves my staff, your staff, as well as our staff, and hopefully the appropriate HMS folks. So, uh, as I think Dewey said or someone said, this is an important thing for us. This is the first real example of private rec reporting on the East Coast it relates to a species that's harvested both commercially and recreationally. So, we really want it to work, and certainly. Basically, it sounds like New Jersey has a wall of shame, I guess would be the best way to put it. Joe Semino. It's actually not to that point, <laughs> Mr. Chair. It's, it's, it's uh, to Chris's point in, in a conversation that and, my, and, and I just had, you know, uh, Jason and I sat at the data workshop years ago. One of the interesting differences, why this is so important, I, I was in Virginia when recreational anglers wanted to report cobia because they thought the MRF estimates were too high. You know, this is a species where we have sometimes zero harvest reported for, for tilefish in the mid-Atlantic when we know that isn't true. So, you know, it's, it's a matter of um, I, I, not, not necessarily a rare event. It's just a matter of, as Adam and I were talking about, uh, these fish are going back to private docks that aren't uh, accessible to the APHIS survey. So. Um, <clears throat> That's why I think this is so important to collect this data, and I appreciate all the comments on ways to improve that. Seeing no more council members' hands up, uh, I see one on the webinar, Fred Akers. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I just want to make a couple points. I'm on the AP, Southfish AP, and the council. Uh, spent a lot of time creating an app for reporting, the EFIN app. Uh, that's what I use. I don't find it particularly difficult, especially after doing it one time. Um, so that's something you should just remember that the council did that and there's another, another option for reporting. Also, um, this is a, a federal permit. You have to go, you know, to know where to get the permit. And I don't understand why they would re not want to put that on the HMS uh, website. I, it was my quote that every HMS permit holder is a potential tilefish fisherman, and that's where it needs to be posted. So when I get my HMS permit, I'm reminded not only for the shark endorsement, but if I want to fish for tilefish, I need a tilefish permit and where to go for that. So thanks, thanks all for your work on this. Thank you, Fred. Brad McHale. Uh, yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Brad McHale, National Marine Fishery Service, Auto Migratory Species Management Division. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to kind of sit in to listen to the dialogue today. I've been jotting down a bunch of notes uh, and willing to, to collaborate and continue to collaborate as we move forward. But just from experience of issuing recreational permits for close to 20 years now, couple things just to help inform the discussion. Regarding putting information on the HMS website, we fully agree um, that that makes sense. The universe overlaps. We have about 10,000 permit holders with recreational permits between New York, New Jersey, Delaware, and Maryland alone. And, but one thing that, and Jason mentioned this earlier is, you need to recognize highly migratory species as Maine through Texas, including the Caribbean. And so if we're going to then single out tilefish, what about those individuals that are trying to attain dolphin wahoo, coastal pelagics, Atlantic mackerel, and the list goes on and on and on. And so that just becomes where the challenge is, is which ones do you single out to notify versus uh, does it just get lost in the noise? Uh, regarding the incentives component, that becomes an extremely high hurdle for the agency to implement. We've tried that or explored it in the past for HMS. Uh, it really becomes insurmountable. Um, although we all recognize it, that it, that carries a lot of weight. Regarding the kind of reminders, if you will, uh, you all will come to a break point of you will start to enable the recreational community that you're trying to derive reports from. So it needs to be the balance of making sure the information is out there and available. And then there has to be the stick that does follow it. And granted, this is only three years soak time, 
for this program. I suspect that stick in two years would be uh, an appropriate based upon our experiences. So those are just kind of some of the nuggets on the feedback. I think it's also should be recognized that, you know, extremely rare that recreational permits are kind of rescinded. That uh, tends to be a very high bar and whether or not that truly gets uh, the impact. There's extreme value in the Facebook posts of shame that that carries a lot of weight when somebody's voice is out there that they've got caught violating regulation. So making poster children out of those uh, will ripple through the industry. Um, and I guess I'll kind of stop there and again, appreciate the opportunity to kind of listen to the dialogue and continue to collaborate as this all evolves. Thank you, Brad. Uh, I want to thank Doug and John. Hannah and Jose for the presentation. Uh, Mary, thank you for your communication. Now, outreach that you do, you didn't get public knowledge or public knowledge, then, but I wanted you to know that we do appreciate all your work. Uh, let's take a five minute break. We'll come back at 2 51. We'll let Kylie get set up and then we'll be ready.
One minute warning, one minute. All right, welcome back, everyone. Let's get take our seats, please, and let's get started. Our next topic is climate change scenario planning. We're going to receive an update from Kylie Dancy. Kylie, the floor is yours. All right, thank you. So uh, I last gave the council an update on this initiative at the, the August council meeting. So I'm not going to kind of recap all of the information that we discussed then, but I, I do want to give an update on the development since that meeting and the next steps and specifically the scenario uh, deepening process that we went through since the August council meeting and our refinement of our four uh, current scenarios as well as our recent manager brainstorming sessions that we've held and talk about next steps and then want to get some um, for, for discussion. We don't have any specific discussion or decision points today, but we did think it would be helpful to have the council you know, begin talking about and thinking about your reactions to these draft scenarios and begin some initial discussion of applications. So as I'll get into, we do plan to have a, a sort of more detailed and in-depth facilitated discussion of this in December, but to the extent that the council can sort of begin thinking about these scenarios and, and what they mean and their potential applications now, I think that's going to help the, the discussion in December be more effective. Let's see if I can get this slide to advance here. Okay, so just a quick reminder of the initiative objectives. This is being conducted by all three East Coast councils and the ASMFC and NOAA fisheries. And the objectives are to explore how East Coast fishery governance and management issues will be affected by climate driven changes in fisheries and, and particular, particularly changing stock availability and distribution. And secondly, to advance a set of tools and processes that will provide us with flexible and robust fishery management strategies, continuing to promote fishery conservation, resilient fishing communities, and address uncertainty in an era of climate change. So this is the initiative timeline you, that you've seen before. We recently completed the scenario creation phase. So as discussed at the last council meeting, we held a workshop in June where we got together approximately 65 stakeholders to have a two and a half day workshop to end up drafting scenarios, which are stories about potential future uh, conditions. And specifically for this initiative, we're aiming at looking at conditions 20 years into the future. And so in addition, as part of the scenario creation phase, following the workshop, we held a set, series of scenario deepening webinars, which I'll talk about on the next slide, but we're now in the applications phase. So this will extend through early 2023. And this is where we uh, focus on applying the scenarios to create ideas for actions and recommendations coming out of this initiative. So I'll talk more about that later in the presentation. And but first, I want to talk about the scenario deepening and where we ended up with each of our four scenarios. So shortly after the August council meeting, the core team held two scenario uh, deepening webinars in mid August. 
And these, the purpose of these was to allow all interested stakeholders an opportunity to review our draft scenarios, to validate them, add details, comment on them, to make sure that we end up with scenarios that are plausible and challenging and relevant and memorable. So these, these meetings were attended by about 150 unique participants. And in response to the feedback that we received during those meetings, which was, which was great feedback, we, the core team further revised the draft scenarios. So the version that's in the briefing book for today is sort of the near final version. We are currently having just a few other people take a look at those, but they should remain pretty close to what is in the briefing book today. So about the scenarios themselves, starting with the framework that was developed, which we talked a little bit about at the last meeting, um, this is a recap. So we have two axes to this framework that represent critical uncertainties about future conditions. And first is the horizontal axis that talks about to what extent will climate change contribute to the predictability of conditions and the ability for us to assess stocks and assess changing conditions. On the left hand side, you know, do conditions become far more unpredictable and existing science is unable to provide much useful information? Or are we moving more toward the right hand side where conditions are sufficiently predictable to allow science to provide, you know, mostly accurate information about stocks and stock locations? The, the vertical axis here is exploring what happens to stock production and species productivity by 2040 as climate change continues. Does it result in overall declining productivity? For example, alongside worsening habitat and low rates of species replacement, or is productivity mostly maintained or increasing with adequate habitat and sufficient levels of species replacement? So combining these into that two by two matrix creates those four quadrants that you see here. And we have a situation where stocks are maintained but hard to assess and locate. Another one where stocks are maintained but mostly straightforward to assess and locate. And then on the bottom, there are declining stocks that are harder to assess and declining stocks that are straightforward to assess. So none of these are necessarily predictions about what's going to happen, but they're kind of stories about possible uh, conditions. So these scenarios were designed to be divergent from each other, but we did acknowledge that there are some aspects that are pretty broadly applicable across all four. These are things that we you know, are pretty, pretty predictable uh, right now that, that we think should be reflected in all four scenarios. So we can assume that ocean temperatures will continue to increase and that's gonna affect species biology and distribution. Regions are likely to exhibit differences in seasonal temperatures. Primary productivity will vary across regions. We can expect sea level rise. Economic and social changes, we, we expect that um, changing ocean uses are creating more competition for fisheries and the coastal population is, is going to grow. So these factors are kind of features of each of the scenarios, but their impact might be a little bit different in each quadrant. So the resulting stories, these are, um, there are, are full narratives developed in the, in the briefing document, but we end up with the top left is what we called ocean pioneers, which is wild west of new ocean users, risk taking fishery operators, taking advantage of confusing and unpredictable, but ultimately positive conditions. And then again, that is where the stock condition is good, but, but conditions are really unpredictable. The top right, we have uh, checks and balance where strong science is combining with collaborative management to help mitigate and adapt to climate driven changes in the ocean. I'm going to talk about these in, in a little bit more detail on the following slides, but this is kind of just a summary of what we're, what we're calling each of these scenarios. Lower right is sweet and sour seafood, where the science is good, but the news is bad. So success here is coming from anticipating lower stocks and preparing for, for new management, new catch limit uh, in this situation where our science is good. The lower uh, left is kind of the worst situation where we have science that's unable to keep up unpredictable changes and declining productivity. So a world with a lot of different sources of stress, the industry is fracturing between some who are able to maybe take advantage of those conditions and others who are losing out. So I'll, I'll go through each scenario. Uh, there are a lot more details in the, in the document. So these are just a couple of the themes of each of them. 
Um, in Ocean Pioneers, we have sort of this weird weather, crazy conditions, unpredictable conditions, and life on the ocean looks a lot different than it did 20 years ago. So climate change might maybe has prompted more investment in alternative energy and aquaculture. The seasons and the locations of fisheries is changing in a sort of unpredictable manner and traditional science is unable to make accurate assessments. Um, so stock productivity is generally pretty good. Species replacement is generally good. So fishermen report that they're still encountering plenty of seemingly healthy stocks. Um, but who is really thriving in these turbulent conditions are the, the ocean pioneers. It requires some risk taking investments in new data gathering technology and uh, deep pockets and ability to ride out the storms of uncertainty. So the, the lower left again, this is a, a source, the quadrant where there's a, a ton of sources of stress. So there's shifts in currents, um, extreme weather events, there's tipping points in the ecosystems where things are thrown out of balance. Major storms are leading to more, you know, there's more pollution, there's degraded habitats, healthy stocks are scarce. This low abundance is leading to reduced harvest, potentially protected species regulations that are closing fishing grounds, and science is largely unable to help as stock assessments can't cope with such a changeable and volatile ecosystem. There's eroded trust in this scenario, illustrated by debates over and the siting of offshore wind installations and, and other things that are going on. In this scenario, operators are forced to shift to lower trophic level species, and there's more need for uh, govern government support, financial support to save a few select fisheries. Sweet and sour seafoods. We have stocks decline, but they're straightforward to assess. So science is good, but the news is bad. Climate change is affecting stock conditions in ways that are pretty predictable or you know able to be assessed by scientists. There's rain shifts, productivity and abundance have uh, declined for most of our relevant species. But we have better forecasting that helps fishermen prepare for things like marine heat waves, localized die-offs. Um, aquaculture is providing a much needed alternative as wild sea wild caught seafood declines and better science is ensuring that uh, pollution dangers are minimized. So there are signs of a few smart management decisions, such as limits on newly arriving species and some adaptation from fishing operators. However, um, most management approaches have, have not adapted to the, the tougher conditions and those on the horizon. Finally, we have the checks and balance in the upper right. Stocks are maintained and straightforward to assess and locate. So this is not necessarily an easy scenario, but it's sort of the, the best case out of these four. So we have good science and smart collaboration and tolerable conditions allowing East Coast fisheries to cope with the challenge of climate change in 2040. So stocks are shifting and expanding their ranges, busier coasts and new offshore activity are creating accessibility cha challenges. So again, we do expect some of those elements in each of these four scenarios. Uh, investments in habitat protection and restoration have begun to reverse uh, damage and loss. Science capacity is boosted, delivering improved ocean monitoring, real-time catch reporting, and population monitoring. A prosperous economy, lead, ocean economy leads to competition between fisheries and aquaculture, and also collaboration, as fishery science is perhaps boosted by wind energy installation. Gentrification is creating uh, concerns over accessibility, however, for the recreational sector. So those are some sort of uh, you know overall summary bullets of each of those four scenarios. So those pretty quick overview, but there are you know a couple pages of narratives in the in the document for for more detail on each of those. So moving on to kind of the the discussion of uh, the applications phase. So what do we do with those draft scenarios? The the first part of the applications phase is recently completed but not yet summarized. This is a series of what we called uh, manager brainstorming sessions. We held those from mid-September through uh, earlier this week. We had one a couple of days ago. And then the purpose of these was to sort of brainstorm, to have a subset of managers from each of the participating organizations sort of generate ideas for applications that we might want to explore in the next pieces of the applications phase using the scenarios as a platform. So. These weren't intended to get, you know, group recommendations, but they were just discussions to 
to generate ideas that will help us figure out what are the main themes of applications that we might want to explore and how, how should we structure our next uh, step, which will be the, the meetings of each management body that will take place in November and December. So at their respective meetings, the commission and each of the three councils are going to set aside time on the agenda for more in-depth discussions of the scenarios and to develop ideas and recommendations from each management body. Those ideas will then support an in-person summit meeting, which is planned for February 2023. That will be is expected to be an in-person meeting that we're targeting right now approximately 50 participants from participating management organizations. And so we don't have a lot of other details at this time. We're just sort of currently designing that and thinking about how that should be structured, but that will serve as a venue for uh, to discuss kind of the, the input from the, the different management body meetings as well as the manager sessions. And the goal of that summit meeting is to sort of come up with a final set of governance management and monitoring recommendations from this process. So again, logistics are a little bit uh, to be determined for the summit meeting, but we are currently working on planning that. So I'm gonna recap, I guess, some of the ideas that we talked about and questions that we asked during these recent manager brainstorming sessions, just to, to get everyone kind of thinking about what we're looking at here in the applications phase. What we're, this is kind of a figure representing what we're trying to get at in this phase. We have scenarios that describe what conditions might be like in 2042. Um, from there, you know, we want to identify what challenges and opportunities to do each of these scenarios create. Given that, what changes or actions do we need to think about now to prepare for future conditions like this? And the scenarios really serve as a tool for, for the discussion. So we're not asking um, you know, folks to, to pick a scenario to work towards or necessarily assuming that we're going to end up in clearly in one box or the other. We're kind of looking to use the scenarios to further examine things that would benefit us and future fishery stakeholders under multiple possible futures. So what actions would be sort of robust to multiple possible future conditions and what actions should we avoid at this point? For the, those manager meetings, we framed the conversation around four broader topics for applications, including management and industry adaptability, Adaptability has been a major theme of both the scenario creation workshop and the conversation since. Data and science is also a big uh, component of this discussion. Alternative ocean uses is another big theme. And then the, the biggest one is the, the cross jurisdictional governance and management. And so, you know, again, that's kind of what this initiative is really getting at. One of the goals of this initiative is just addressing governance and management issues related to shifting stocks. So we did find, you know, during our recent manager sessions, there was a lot of energy around all of these topics, but that topic in particular, and we had a lot of good discussion on all of these. So during these um, recent webinars, we did kind of delve into these four categories by asking a series of questions for each of these categories. And this is a little bit hard to read, but these are in the sort of in a, in a different version in the document. But we're, for adaptability, we're looking at questions like, what does adaptability and nimbleness look like for both for managers and for industry? What are the barriers to effective adaptability? And if we knew that the situation was going to play out, what actions would we take now to increase our ability to adapt to these conditions? And a similar set of questions for the, for the other three categories. So for data and science, you know, what opportunities do we have for data and science to contribute to fisheries success? What are, the, what are our challenges with that? For newer alternative ocean uses, what are, again, our most significant opportunities and challenges posed by these new ocean uses? And if we knew that the scenario was going to occur, how, what would we do to ensure that it resulted in a positive or a minimal impact on fisheries? And then for cross-jurisdictional governance and management, what major stresses are going to be placed on our existing arrangements? What are current approaches for updating management authority or addressing different management jurisdiction work well, or are there new ways that should be considered? And then what management challenges are present for species that 
move across jurisdictional boundaries? What do we need to do to better manage species that we are expecting or seeing move across these jurisdictional boundaries? So we had some good discussion on all of those questions for um, each scenario in each of these categories at these, these recent sessions. So I think those are good you know, questions for the council to be thinking about as well as we move into today's discussion and then um, particularly the December um, meeting. So that is pretty much all I have for the update today. And again, we don't need anything specific in terms of decision points for the council today, but this is a good opportunity you know, for folks to share what you think of these draft scenarios, what, what's your, what are your initial reactions, what themes are you finding particularly important, and what are your initial ideas on potential applications of these scenarios. So again, in December, the Council will have a facilitated discussion on this and you know, should be prepared during that discussion to get to some recommendations for applications. So as I mentioned, you know, we're currently designing those next meetings as well as the summit meetings. So if you have any recommendations on how we might structure those for effective conversation and development of recommendations, we would be, um, be happy to hear those. So I believe that's all I have. Happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Kali. Any questions? Great job, apparently. Chris Moore. Mr. Chair, I just want to emphasize why Kylie is here today talking about this, and that's really to tee up our conversations in December. So um, we had the overview. Some of you uh, participated in these managers, uh, managers' meetings over the last couple of weeks. But really think about all those questions that she posed to you all today. So we do have a good conversation in December. That's scheduled. What day were you we're thinking about? Wednesday, I think. It's that now. So that'll be a, a facilitated uh, conversation. And again, just prepare yourself for that. Michelle Duvall. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thanks to Kylie. And I think, you know, kudos to the whole steering committee that's been working on this. I really think that the scenarios that, you know, the intent of which was to generate the type of feedback that you all were looking for during the manager um, focus sessions, you know, did their job. I mean, I, I feel like, you know, the one I participated in, we had a very robust discussion um, of all four of those different aspects. And I guess just, you know, in terms of, um, you know, considering what to consider in the next steps of the applications phase, and maybe something we should think about is, you know, I, Think about the adaptability issue and um, how, you know, what are the limits of that within our current legal constraints. I think, you know, we talked about um, making sure that our approaches are nimble, but, you know, we don't, we might want to try some things out informally before they sort of get set in stone. So I, I just think about what are the what are the limits of adaptability, and that's you know for managers within our current management framework, as well as because um, I'm not so sure Congress is going to do anything. Um, so, but also what are the limits of adaptability for industry as well? So it's just something I put out there. Thanks. Seeing no more questions from the council members, anyone in the audience or online? Seeing no more, Kylie. Oh, Kylie, you got another comment? I guess just something Michelle said just made me think I, I should clarify that I guess we've been kind of thinking about this in, in terms of both thinking about recommendations under our current system and our current legal constraints, as well as recommendations that maybe aren't fitting under our current Magnuson constraints or other constraints. Um, we didn't necessarily want to limit ourselves and, and limit you all to thinking about, you know, what can we do under our current system? Um, I and mean, we have to be careful about the recommendations coming out of this. The councils, you know, can't lobby for specific changes, obviously, but thinking about recommendations that could be made without the constraints of our current system, as well as what we would need to do under our current system. And that's a lot to think about, but we're kind of not 
limiting ourselves to the current constraints. Thank you, Kylie. Seeing no more questions, I think we are done with this topic. Thank you. Our next topic on the agenda is Spiny Dogfish 2023 specifications. Jason Didden will be presenting, and we will need to approve the 2023 fishing year specifications. So, Jason, whenever you're ready. Stephen, can you pull that presentation up? Thank you. So this would be for uh, 2023 spine dogfish specs, the fishing years May 1 uh, to April 30. So currently 2022 fishing year, the ABC is about 17 and a half thousand metric tons. Uh, it's just a little under 39,000 million pounds. That ABC was built off the 2018 assessment and associated projections. Projections actually went through 2021, but then um, not having anything else, they were extended to 2022 um, coming out of that assessment. So the quota is just shy of 30 million pounds. Fishery is open access, uh, but requires a permit. Uh, There's a 7,500 pound federal trip limit. Uh, there are also regional state quotas and, and trip limits that are set uh, via the uh, commission, the ASMSC. We also currently have a research track assessment ongoing, um, looking for a review of that in December 2022. Uh, but with landing trends down and indices down, um, that usually is not kind of a happy ending as far as assessments go. Um, so not quite sure what uh, the result of that assessment is going to be, um, but it's, there are some signs uh, that, um, that it may not be great. So then, Know, kind of the new assessment procedure. We'll get a, a management track assessment in 2023. I don't think the date of that has been set yet, but um, pro probably the the summer management track um, assessment scheduling, and then that will determine the stock status in future ABCs. Quick review from the fishery information document that we put together for the advisory panel. Uh, you can see the low quotas and landings back when federal fishery started and the stock was overfished. Uh, quotas came up, landings followed for a few years, but then, uh, <clears throat> but then eventually, uh, after 2012, landings have generally been trending down. The quota went up for a bit and came down, um, then up a little bit more. But uh, but again, the, so the landings kind of kept track with the increasing quota for a few years when the fishery recommenced. Um, but but not fully. Just prices, uh, just get a sense, you know, overall downward trend. However, since, um, you know, in, in the last seven or eight years, we've seen a general trend upwards since 13. Those are in 2021 um, inflation adjusted dollars per pound. So um, the blue line here is landing so far this fishing year since May 1. The orange line there are landings in the 2021 fishing year, uh, which totaled about 10.4 million pounds. Uh, I've been kind of going back and forth with Garfo a bit on exactly what that figure was. Originally, it was like 10.1 uh, or 2. Then there were some indications that it was closer to 11. Um, you know, there's been a lot of database changes as Garfo has been transitioned to CAMS and then just general data cleanup. Uh, but I've had some more recent back and forth with Garfo staff. Um, the best uh, number for 2021 is 10.4 million pounds. And again, we're on a similar trajectory so far this year. Uh, at the committee meeting, do we had a question kind of trying to get a little perspective on how this fishery operates through the year? Um, started to get into some data confidentiality issues with limited numbers of dealers. But uh, when I put 2018, 19, and 20 data together, um, 
and then you know try to get a sense um, for folks of just how the fishery operates through the year. Rhode Island, Mass, New Hampshire kind of starts, and then when I'm thinking starting, I'm thinking with the May 1 fishing year, mostly Massachusetts landings, mostly June through early October. Um, and I've got kind of have that normal distribution plot on the bottom there. Landings start off in each area in these time frames, kind of low, peak generally in the middle of the time frames on the slide, and then taper off. Uh, New Jersey, Maryland, mostly late October through December, a little bit in the spring sometime also. And then Virginia is mostly late November through early April. Uh, so the kind of the fishery rolls uh, regionally through through the fishing year. Uh, also from the fishery information document, just trends in vessels, um, few vessels participating at larger levels when federal fishery um, kind of shut things down, um, and then a trend up as the fishery recommenced, like that landings figure we saw earlier, and then a trail off in vessels uh, most recently again. So we take that fishery information document, take it to the advisory panel, and this was what uh, kind of a synopsis of their input to us. So the COVID-19 didn't have a huge impact on this particular fishery, but uh, demand has been low in general, and it's been kind of stably low um, recently. Uh, a sense of the market could support more landings um, than in the most recent year. Participation and produ production at the vessel level increased, and um, but uh, better opportunities in other fisheries have kind of um, dampened that participation. An example that was provided was uh, some of the vessels that have recently in past years participated in Virginia, we're focusing on oysters and shrimp in, in the last couple of years. There continues to be kind of some interest to increase the trip limit further. The councils, um, and this is a jointly managed stock with the Mid-Atlantic and New England, the councils um, voted to increase the trip limit uh, to 7,500 from 6,000 pounds starting this most recent fishing year. Um, there is still interest, at least by some, to kind of continue increasing to try to stimulate more interest um, in some of those vessels. There's a lot of concern uh, voiced by the AP that we, we have not and are not getting good data on spiny dogfish biomass uh, concerns about, um, you know, does the survey cover the area where spiny dogfish um, are? We know not fully. Um, uh, just general survey performance in terms of when does a vessel leave the dock, does it leave the dock, the survey vessel has had some performance issues in the spring survey in recent years. Um, and then there's been some um, studies recently that have shown that the fish spend a fair bit of time off the bottom. Um, and again, how does that how does that impact the information we're, we're getting from the survey? And the current assessment is trying to get into this question a bit through some vast modeling which you know, kind of can incorporate trends um, in distribution or water temperatures um, at, you know, as part of calculating an, an index. Um, so the current assessment is trying to get at this sum. It's probably not going to be able to get to it fully, um, but there are some efforts in that regard. In general, if we we're getting kind of a similar slice of the dogfish each year, we, again, we know they're off the bottom sometimes. We know they're out of the survey to some degree. If they're doing that in a similar way each year, you're still getting a decent trend out of the survey. Um, and again, some of that, the vast work in the current assessment will might try to tease some of that out. So going to the SSC, um, we uh, got some um, input, again, kind of reiterating uh, from the public concern about, about the survey um, to try to do uh, a bit of back of the envelope ground truthing of it um, I kind of stole an idea from Andy Jones. He's working on some um, neat catch per unit of effort uh, work in the current assessment, combining trawl observer data and trawl study fleet data to try to get like a, a, a CPUE. Um, and so I just um, looked at trawl observer data, calculated pounds of dogfish uh, caught per hour, and we have like tens of thousands of observed trawl tow hours in recent years. So there's a lot of data there. Um, and it, I mean, the, the trends in what the observers are seeing on trawl vessels, um, like match 
uh, the survey data um, quite well. So it, it, it kind of, at least from staff's perspective, kind of buttressed the fact that um, you know the, the fleet for observer data seems to be seeing um, kind of same, some of the same trends that we're seeing in, in trawl survey. Um, now the observer data since 2019 with COVID, you know, we're still kind of digesting how to deal with that. And again, this is kind of like preliminary work from the assessment, so it hasn't gone through the peer review and whatnot, but um, the work that Andy was doing kind of showed the similar decline um, in that CPUE. The neat thing about his incorporation of study fleet data is it keeps kind of chugging along through COVID, um, didn't have the same decline in data inflow as the observer data had. Um, and since 2019 into 2020 and 2021, saw similar declines um, and as, as a survey did. So again, uh, the fleets appear to be seeing some of the same trends as a survey. So um, kind of a quick, uh, Dr. Rego is going to give um, some input from the SSC's perspective, but a quick overview of the SSC's um, kind of rationale and what they did. Said, okay, um, it looks like biomass has dropped about 40% from the 16, 17, 18 average of the data points to the 21, 22 average, no data point in 20. Um, again, this is a spring trawl survey data, which is what dogfish has been based off in recent years. So that 40%, you know, is roughly like an 11% decline per year for that four and a half year average period, kind of covering from like 2017 to 21 and a half. Um, so they looked at what the ABC um, kind of would have been in 2019 with the current risk policy um, and applied a 40% reduction to that. And that's how they got their 7,788 metric ton 2023 ABC. Now the ABCs have been drifting up a bit since 2019. Um, so it's actually a bigger reduction from 2022, um, but their rationale was kind of focused <clears throat> on the change in the survey um, and, and then scaling that 2019 ABC. So I'll turn it over to Dr. Rago for some additional input from the SSC perspective. Okay, thank you, Jason. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, thank you. And thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, next slide, please. I just, just wanted to give a, a bit of an overview of the process that the SSC used for uh, ABC determination. The key, def the key factors, as Jason mentioned first, um, the trend in the female spawning stock biomass in this in this in a, in this uh, bottom trawl survey uh, showed uh, you know a, a continuing downward trend despite the catches being below the ABC um, and, and in fact were the lowest in the time series record. Um, the, uh, there's relatively low incoming production. And uh, importantly, uh, there's evidence of slower growth. Uh, most recent aging study is suggesting that uh, the dogfish are growing more slowly than they had in the past. Um, so that is evidence of a productivity uh, shift downward. Um, Jason's analysis of the LPUE trends uh, was very compelling, you know, and it did suggest that you have additional validation beyond whatever limitations might be perceived in the uh, bottom trawl survey. And then finally, um, there was a question, is, is this simply due to an availability shift such as we saw in 2006 and so forth? And the, the literature and, and the, the peer review publications suggest that the declines in availability uh, occur when the ocean is cooler. Uh, however, the, in recent years, those trends have been warmer. Um, the second consideration or major thing to consider is should we be adjusting the previously determined ABC or the OFL um, for a number of reasons outlined in our report to the council. Uh, we use the ABC as the basis for making adjustments. Um, we also were concerned about this being um, consistent with the council risk policy, so we, we did apply um, the, the revised risk policy. Uh, that was uh, approved several years ago and not the one that was in place when the original set of uh, ABCs were, were determined. Um, so we also felt it was, it was extremely important that this process be 
it's, and it's an interim process, but it needs to be transparent and reproducible. Um, so what we did was look at a, a ratio of the recent average survey catches for 21 and 22 and compared them to uh, that same, an average for a three-year period, um, 2016 and 2018. Now, of course, 2020 was not available because of, of COVID prevented the survey from being conducted. Uh, we also took a look at uh, the trends that were evidenced in this ratio and, and confirmed them by looking at some regression analyses for those same data. So, you know, collectively, there were a, a fair amount of, of signals that, that suggested that the stock had declined and, in fact, uh, something should be done. So, next. Uh, Slide, please. Um, you know, you might ask, you know, why why didn't we just leave it alone? Um, the the uh, uh, general approach has been, in the absence of uh, new data uh, or strong evidence of change, uh, quotas or APCs are carried over. Um, but in this case, uh, the, the collective judgment of the SSC was that the status quo was not appropriate given the set of signals. Um, you know, the approach that was used is conceptually similar to the plan B smooth, which is used for um, a number of uh, stocks in the, in the Northeast um, and serves as a backup. Um, and ultimately, you know, all these complications were, you know, due to, you know, the delayed research track assessment, uh, you know, there were, there were logistic difficulties in getting all the aging uh, data assembled. Um, and of course, uh, we get it, uh, you know, it's difficult to support both the research track assessment and the needs of the Mid-Atlantic uh, Council uh, simultaneously. So uh, the research track uh, requirements and, and staffing and so forth um, uh, took precedence and so we get it. Uh, but, uh, you know, the need for advice continues under the Magnus and Stevens Act. So that's what we uh, uh, came up with. So then just a little more detail on the on the approach. Next slide, please. Um, the quota, as as Jason mentioned, is uh, 7,788 metric tons. Uh, we adjusted the ABC in 2019 to um, under the current Council risk policy to 12,978. Um, there are swept area estimates of female biomass uh, for 21 and 22, which are 61.413, uh, and um, 2016, the earlier period of 102. So you take the ratio of those two numbers, 61 divided by 102, and multiply it by uh, 12,978, and you get the 70. Seven uh, seven thousand seven hundred eighty-eight metric tons. So that's that's the computation. And as Jason mentioned, unfortunately, it's a fifty-five percent decrease uh, from the uh, previously specified twenty twenty-two survey, which would have occurred had an, a status quo recommendation been uh, considered. So um, finally, the the sources of uncertainty. Um, next slide, please. Uh, you know, the, 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 the biggest source highlighted by the SSC was the, the lack of an updated stock assessment. Um, there's um, the survey data missing for 2020 is, uh, is, is, is problematic. Um, and, you know, the absence of changes in the size, frequency, distribution of mature females may more importantly, reflect changes in growth and, and reductions in stock productivity. So there is evidence of maturing at an earlier uh, or smaller sizes. There is evidence of, uh, of slower growth, um, both of which are highly problematic uh, when, you're, when you're trying to forecast uh, future uh, stock conditions. Um, and one of the one of the key recommendations that the SSC uh, had was that uh, there really needs to be a, a, a greater investment in, in the stock assessment capacity. Um, we may not have been able to, we may have come to the same conclusion um, as as in this instance, but um, the you know, it it would have had uh, a stronger scientific support, um, you know, under under the given circumstances. So. 
I'll turn it back over to Jason and then um, we can answer questions at the end. Thank you. Thanks. <clears throat> so from the ABC kind of come all the rest of the specifications. Um, the monitoring committee developed some recommendations um, on some of them um, and the committee has a recommendation also. Uh, some of them are, are, are relatively simple, and these are two of them here. Um, one, we deduct for Canada. Canadian landings have been quite low of late. We also deduct expected recreational landings. Um, the 2021 MRIP value for that was a bit high relative to the time series, um, but it will, um, you know, 2023, if you look at the time series, will probably be a bit less than that. Um, Again, this isn't a, a, a large part of the overall ABC, but may add a little bit of a, of a buffer in and of itself there. Um, the more problematic uh, set aside uh, is for discards. Um, and you know, the 16 to 18 average was about 3,500 metric tons, which starts to become quite a bit of our current ABC. Uh, so kind of thinking about that, going to the monitoring committee, you know, staff, uh, recalled back, um, you know, this graph that discard rates appear to have been following um, the trends in biomass. Well, if that's true, then we would expect discards to have kind of be going down also. Um, so we kind of took that 40% reduction in apparent biomass, applied that to the average discard. So that comes out to about 2,088 metric tons. Um, and that seems like a reasonable way to specify 2023 20, 20, discards, um, but there's a lot of uncertainty in that. Um, again, that's kind of, um, you know, making an, uh, a presumption that discards are gonna follow that trend in biomass um, the center, one of the center scientists kind of asked me to kind of flag that, you know, even if that's true for uh, the SSB, the, fem the larger females, um, and that's gone down, you don't know exactly what males or smaller females have done. Maybe you don't get um, as quite as much bang um, for your buck as reduced discards as you see that reduced trend in female biomass. But when you compare the trends, they seem to line up pretty well. Um, that would be lower than all the previous estimates of discards in the time series for the assessment. Um, so again, it seems reasonable, but there's some uncertainty there. And then that kind of gets into um, the management uncertainty buffering that the council considers, um, you know, given everything else. And this is really just, you don't want to exceed the ACL. Why not? Well, maybe you damage the stock and we also have pound for pound, metric ton for metric ton paybacks uh, with spiny dogfish. So if there's any overage in 2023, um, paybacks apply to most likely 2025. It's supposed to be kind of like as soon as possible. That's typically when it would happen. So, um, you know, obviously it's hard to predict the future, but you know, given where the assessment's been headed so far, really not anticipating the higher 2025 ABC um, and if that ABC is lower, then paybacks become even more painful. Um, now, you know, we, uh, the monitoring committee looked at a range of buffers. Um, you know, it's probably not, you know, the, the highest of those is really 18%, not expecting, um, you know, a big buffer, a big overage with even an 18% buffer, but I wouldn't bet my life that you couldn't end up with an overage even with an 18% buffer. Um, right, you get a couple, uh, you know, a, a, an unlucky run of observer trips. That discard estimate jumps instead of going down, and then and then you've got a major overage. Um, but you, know, you wouldn't expect it to be major with an 18% buffer. Um, and with no buffer, again, if those discards don't go down as hoped, um, then 2025 could be stuck. So, pros of bigger buffers: less likely to damage the stock avoid big overages, don't affect 2025, quota stability. The cons of the bigger buffers, um, and we've got an input that if you have a big buffer, you may force the closure of the last processor and collapse this industry. It's also, if you have a big buffer in general, it's gonna be hard to catch OY because you're gonna have set aside a lot of potential quota 
and is unavailable to the fishery. Pros of smaller buffers, more likely to utilize a full ABC. Industry says they can hold on with a quote of around 12 million pounds. But on the flip side, Ponds of smaller buffers, um, again, you're more likely to maybe damage the stock further or um, have a big overage and have to pay that back in 2025. So the staff recommendation kind of said, you know, this discard specification is uncertain, um, but repayments are going to be more painful if 2025 ABC is even lower. But industry says they won't even be here in 2025 with a large buffer now. So, you know, essentially go and try a 5% buffer. Um, if I'm kind of taking industry, um, you know, what they've said, it's like you've got no chance of success on one hand and, you know, maybe a small chance of success on the other hand with a 5% buffer. But, you know, small versus no, I'll go with the small. Um, so there's still a risk of, risk of a major overage even with a 5% buffer, but um, you know, given the potential impact on industry, that was staff's recommendation. Um, that would put the quota around, um, you know, more or less around 2021 landings, which are again, were about 10.4 million pounds. This quota would be 11.2. There's likely some other buffering due to the state allocations and transfer challenges. The commission has, again, uh, some regional and state allocations. The states can shuffle quota around, but they can't do it, you know, instantaneously it's not you know the, a perfectly efficient process they try to you know try to shuffle quarter around as best they can but they're you know they're probably not going to be able to utilize completely whatever you know a, a 9 10 11 million pound quota because of that allocation and just kind of some inefficiency and in transfer they're probably not going to use it completely so that's going to add a little bit of a, extra buffering as well so that kind of all assumes the commission kind of follows along with a similar quarter reduction. Um, if they don't do that, then kind of all bets are off. And there have been times in the past when the commission has um, not kind of um, kind of done its own thing, but um, that's can't deal with that at this point, I think. Um, so, and then if the assessments raise flags kind of in either direction, the councils uh, could uh, always seek emergency action. Uh, so the uh, table was in the monitoring committee summary. Uh, it's just a list out of the specifications with 0%, 5%, 13%, and 18% uh, buffers. So uh, the committee had a lot of discussion on this, as you can imagine. Um, they did ultimately recommend a 5% buffer, which leads to an 11.2 million pound quota. Um, the kind of focus of the rationale of, 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 of this um, committee motion that passed was, again, the uncertainty in the discards, the threat of substantial repayments if you go over, um, and 5% kind of seemed to balance the potential repayment issue with, with the industry viability question, considering there's also a little bit of extra buffering because of that state allocation issue. Um, but again, there's a lot of uncertainty and kind of risk either way, it seems, with this, um, given the, you know, again, potential impacts on um, industry or or the in the short run or in the medium run for 2025 of, of overages. And I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Any questions for Jason? Pat Gear. Thank you. Um, Jason, what were the PSCs on the um, 2021 MRAP data? Um, the PSEs are, are all pretty high. I think it came up at the committee, looked at it for the most recent few years. I think they were between maybe like 40 and 60. Um, I just ballparking it. So they, they, which would be relatively high for a, a coast wide number. Um, but again, I, I think it's not something that they run into that frequently. So those, even the coast wide PSEs are relatively high compared to some other fish. Any more questions, comments? Joe Semino. Yeah, thanks, Jason. You always do a great job. So I'm just, we're talking not just about a quota overage, we're talking about 
exceeding the ABC, correct? So is this mostly a concern of not an, not knowing the this cards and the factors that are playing in? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I um, you know, landings are, if the commission kind of goes along, I wouldn't expect landings um, to be higher than the quota. Again, if anything, they're probably going to be a bit lower because of the allocation issue. I think we're probably okay on the rec side. The Canadian side is probably not going to be an issue. The issue is more is if discards come in 5,000 metric tons and we've predicted two, then we're three over and we're paying six million, you know, six, seven million pounds back. Um, yeah, so it's really the uncertainty about the discards potentially creating an ACL overage and then pay it back. Yeah. Shell Duval. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks, Jason. So I noticed that um, you said that the in the briefing materials that the new CAM system is being used for the landings, and that that's there's seems to be a fairly consistent. Was it like six to ten percent higher spiny dogfish landings as a result of that system? I mean, is that throughout the time series? So that's what we that those are the numbers that are used in. In the briefing materials, right, as the landings from the new CAM system. I think it's going to go back and forth a little bit, um, depending on the kind of you know which briefing document, because I was getting kind of different input from Garfo on. Um, but the ten point four is CAMs, but only the dealer segment out of CAMs. CAMs also has um, a uh, it, it can detect orphan VTRs that don't appear in the dealer data and add them back in. Um, they do that for some of the quota monitoring and not for others. I think it's a bigger issue that CAMS has to figure out. Is, um, I think, but the 10.4 is just the straight dealer landings. Um, and I think for the time being, that's what GARFA would be monitoring based on. Um, I think there's enough uncertainty um, with what the those orphan VTRs mean for dogfish, um, I don't think they're going to get added back in. So that 10.4, that is kind of the most recent number for 2021. Um, that's coming out of CAMS, but it doesn't have the orphans back in added back in. Um, and since the other data here doesn't use that, I think we'll probably just, you know, I, I think until some additional investigation goes on, my sense is Garfo is going to stick with, you know, not adding the those orphans in for quarter monitoring. So the 10.4 is the number from the most recent year. That would be kind of an apples to apples of, of, of I think, how the fishery would be monitored, at least in 2023. But it sounds like it's a bit of an ongoing discussion at Garfo. questions from council members Dewey yeah thank you Jason for the presentation uh, in it you said that industry was aware that if they went over they would have a payback pound for pound payback in 2025 correct yes that's definitely been made clear Questions from the audience, John Whiteside. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair. I'm not sure if it's questions for Jason or if I have comments and questions about the entire presentation as a whole before there is a vote. So I'm not sure if now is the time I should be addressing that or hold. Yes, go ahead. Thank you. In the entire presentation, both from Jason and Dorego and his team, there are two huge buffers that are baked into this ABC. Uh, first is the SSC's ABC, where they use the 2022 survey numbers, which uh, Dr. Rago said was the lowest in the time series, which showed a catastrophic 89% drop in the SSB from 
2021 to 2022, which no one finds credible. Everyone here knows that the stock didn't drop like that. The same as when with the 2017 study uh, survey, excuse me, that showed an 87% catastrophic drop. And then it rebounded again. Those are just flawed surveys. And it's, I've been saying it time after time, and uh, it's good that we have someone here from NOAA uh, who might take it back that the almost annual, we can almost count on the Bigelow not leaving the dock and not completing its mission. So that in the last, off the top of my head, nine years, I think it's completed it twice. And I've been told that in order to catch fish, you have to take the boat off the dock and then go to all the stations, and it doesn't. So the SSC and, and then coming down to us and then industry, we have to rely on this flawed data. There's a huge, enormous buffer just using 21 and 22. So that came down with an artificially low ABC, which was 55.5% lower than the current fishing year. That's the first enormous buffer that's built into this. The second is the, we have to look at how the ASMFC allocates the southern quota, and it does to the states. And that is going to leave as much as a million pounds in the water, that you just can't shift it all around in time. And I've been saying repeatedly for months now that we cannot go below 12 million pounds. We really need 15, but absolutely not below 12. And at the Dogfish Committee, there were two options. One was 11.1, .1, and the other was 12 million. And that was shown for a, a, just a few seconds on the screen. The 12 million pound TAL will amount to really more like 11 million, because we're not going to be able to shift everything around in the south. So that's the second buffer that's already built into this. There's an imminent risk that is real, that if we go below a 12 million pound quota, the one processor is going to stop buying. They're not going to do dogfish anymore. And if that happens, and it will be solely due to unnecessarily high buffers, this will result in an unchecked dogfish biomass that's going to prey on all other juvenile stocks. The huge cut to monkfish. Odd, I don't even need to go any further. Any of the wreck species. Because we're not sampling dogfish throughout the water column. We're not sampling them at night when they are more prevalent. And that's what we end up with with this artificially low ABC. So I would really urge the council to not adopt the 11.1, but the 12, point, uh, the 12 million pound quota, which was only shown for a matter of a couple seconds in that one slide. Uh, so I, please, we can't, we can't do it at 11. And that was presented at the committee and it was done at the monitoring committee and at the SSC. And I can't say anything more on that. I know there are people who are trying to call in who have comments as well. Thank you. Michelle, did you have another statement? Hand still up. I'm later. I'm good for now. Thank you. Uh, looks like, I hope I get this right, P. Juilliard? Yep, that's me. So uh, I'm basically speaking on behalf of industry and touch a little bit on what John said. Um, really, 15 million is our, our kind of crisis line. Uh, 12 million is, you know, we're going to, we're going to, 
anything under 12 million, I, I just don't think that we'll be able to stay afloat at all. We can't keep the lights on, can't keep enough cutters, and uh, the weight won't make sense coming through the plant. So really, if that is the case and it's going to be an 11.1 or below, I just don't see industry recovering. Um, and I know that it's been presented it might only be a year, but one, once you once we stop cutting, it'll be nearly impossible to get this item back on menus and back in people's plates or buildings or processing plants. And uh, I, I really just don't see how we survive. Um, so I, I don't have much more to say. It really is uh, 15 million would have been our crisis point. Now 12 million is like, I mean, pure panic mode. I'm not sure we truthfully will be able to continue cutting dogfish if it's an 11 million pound quota. And the fact that we are the last processor in the United States and you know globally, really, I, I don't see what happens if the stock does come back. What do we do then? Thanks. Thank you. Scott McDonald. Hi, I'm, uh, I'm the largest fish buyer in the South in Virginia. I lease my building. It's up for renewal the end of this year. Anything less than 15 million, I don't renew. I've been here for 30 years. I can't survive. That's going to take a big chunk out of what C Trade gets because I don't know who else down here is going to buy them. So I just want to reiterate what John and, and Pierre have said. This cripples us and it's all based on bad science. Nothing more, nothing less. And that's, like I said, it's, th this is going to end us. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Are there any call-in phone calls that I can't see a hand raised that I'm missing? Hearing none, any further comment from or questions from the council? Jason, I do believe we have a monitoring committee motion want to put it up on the board and we will see if we can even get a first or a second on it. Well, this is a past motion from the committee. Oh. Um, so does not need a second, but this is from the spiny dogfish committee. Sonny, I think you need to read it into the minutes. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I move that the council adopt a 5% management uncertainty buffer with the other specifications used by the monitoring committee to result in an 11.2 million pound commercial quota win for the committee. All right, so Sonny is reading this into the record for the committee. We don't need a second. Any debate? From the council. Do we? Yeah, I'd like to substitute a motion if I could. Where's Colette? No. <laughs> Go ahead, Dewey. Yeah, I, I would uh, move that the council adopt a zero management uncertainty buffer with other specifications used for monitoring the committee to result in a 12 uh, million pound commercial quota. And if I get a second, I'll speak to it. Yeah, I'll second. Okay. Second by Scott Lennox. Yeah. Speak on it. Yeah, let's let Jason get a chance to type it up on the board. Okay. 
Uh, Stephen, could you scroll down a bit? Why that's on top on one. Dilly. Yeah, I think that having history in the dogfish back in the day and experiencing the collapse of the market and going from catching all you want to virtually zero, I think industry realizes that they're at kind of a, a dividing point where it's either roll the dice or you're gone. And industry realizes that at 12 million pounds, uh, even though last year the bu there's a buffer here compared to last year's landings that they're willing to roll that dice because they might not be here in 2025. And if, if we were to have a collapse of the industry of harvesting spiny dogfish uh, and industry's gone, I don't see it coming back. And I think industry realizes, um, and also, you know, that they, the numbers of the uncertainty of the uh, discards could be a effect in the future also. And they're willing to roll that dice. And I, I think this is a small um, price to pay for existence and continue existence. And so I would, uh, uh, not only do I, uh, make this motion, but I hope others would support it. Thank you. Thank you, Dewey. Skip Feller. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would definitely support Dewey on this, uh, mainly because we saw what happened in 1999 when they shut it down and they told us that we would never see this fish come back in our lifetime. They said it would be a hundred years before they recovered. In less than 10, they were taking over. And if this doesn't happen and this industry goes away, I would not like to see the world five years from now when the dogfish start taking over. Because like I said, they will eat literally everything. And the only way to save it is to save this last cutting house. And if they need 12 million pounds to survive they need 12 million pounds to survive and i don't think i don't think anybody should want to roll the dice and see this fishery go away peter hughes thank you hopefully you can hear me wes yes okay great thanks um I, I am supportive of uh, Dewey's motion for the, you know, a lot of the same reasons that the last speaker just uh, just just brought up. There's one cutting house left on the east coast of the United States. It's cutting dogfish, and dogfish, as we all know, are very ravenous uh, uh, species of of small, you know, I would say coastal shark, but small small shark, um, and uh, I I can't. I can't in good faith allow this cut in house to go out of business. Um, and then I, you know, I, I think of, of, of people who are entrepreneurs, who's the entrepreneur that's going to come along and say, Hey, you know what? I want to go into the dogfish fishery. Um, when, when the, when the species does come back, um, because we have seen, you know, this, this unique resilience to the species. So, um, I, I fully support uh, the the motion to substitute, uh, and I will be voting when when the time comes. So, thank you very much, Eric Reed. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. I, um, yeah, I fully support this motion. If I could vote, I would certainly vote to support it. Socioeconomics is part of our reasoning in making any motion. And I, I can tell you that uh, Mr. Juilliard's father was one of the first dogfish cutters in Bedford. The last thing I want is his son to be the last one. 
dogfish, I mean, they're, they're Mr. Hughes is right, they're pretty ravenous, and I, I can't believe we're talking about dogfish being in trouble, but uh, I, I just, I can't, can't explain enough what it takes to process a dogfish. It's a filthy, dirty mess. You got to get rid of all the skin and the cartilage and all the pieces and parts to produce that particular product for markets throughout Europe. You now the bellies go one way, one way, the backs go another way. It, it, it's extremely complicated and it's extremely competitive. And to lose the last processor, um, I, I, I think that would be a socioeconomic disaster. So I, I guess I can, I'll stop there for now, but that, that's, I, I can't see it happening. And I'm only speaking for myself. I can't tell you what New England is going to do. I want to make that clear. We have to approve it as well. But my personal opinion is what I just said. So thank you. Chris, Pat Savage. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, yeah, I certainly appreciate the, and understand the precarious Position that the uh, industry finds itself in dogfish uh, fishery is a lot different than the other fisheries that we that we manage. Um, uh, there's not a lot of wiggle room for adapting uh, when you have things like this occur. However, um, I, I support the underlying motion with the five percent uh, management uncertainty buffer. Uh, I think all the all the signals point in the same direction um, in terms of. Where, where the stock is going, uh, it's it's not just the trial survey, which shows a lot of interannual variability and uh, some years where uh, not not all the stations were uh, you know were, were sampled. Uh, it's 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 more than that uh, this time. Uh, we're we're not getting to a level that we saw back uh, twenty over twenty years ago when we went from an unlimited fishery down to a four million pound bycatch fishery. Yeah, I think this is trying to you know, pump the brakes now so we don't find ourselves uh, in, in, a, in a worse situation. Um, and you know, I, I, I kind of go back to Jason um, showing us the, the trend in the, uh, the, the discard estimate. Um, yeah, we're, you know, that, that's, that's rolling the dice where it's the lowest estimate we've ever seen. If we're wrong, um, that could have some pretty big implications couple years down the road. Um, and the last po point I'll, I'll make and mention this at the, at the committee level, yeah, there is a lot of uh, quota tied up at the state level for, for spiny dogfish, but states have kind of gotten become more, have become more efficient uh, transferring quota over the years, you know, not just spiny dogfish. Um, and, you know, certainly I think it would be challenging to transfer all the quota over to where it's fully utilized. I think just the way the states are able to operate uh, now, uh, more quota could be transferred to states in need than we would have seen a few years ago. So, thanks. Sonny Gwynn. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I, um, I would like to support this motion too. You know, I've heard a lot in, about the uh, uncertainty I think that um, it, it'll be a it'll be a terrible thing to lose these fish houses. We're losing too many now. We're going to wake up one day, and you know, God God hopes that we never have COVID again. But if something like that ever happens, there won't be people like us commercial fishermen to, to feed the people. And um, we we have to make sure that these communities have fish houses and have fish to to process. And I don't think it's asking too much. Um, you know, we are at a catch 22 spot, you know, and if things happen in 25 and, and, and it goes south, well, you know, it'd probably be better to just go with it now and, and keep them open. And let's hope that it doesn't go that way. And so we can keep these fish houses and keep the fishermen working. It's just a shame that, um, you know, it's come to this and I, I'm certainly hope that we can get everybody to support this motion. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Dan Farnham. Yep, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, I too would like to support the uh, motion to substitute. You know, at the um, at the committee meeting came up, I, I brought it up, full disclosure, but as far as the discard uh, guard rates being low, you know, through the years, most of the trawl fleet 
they, they morphed into using the big mesh rope nets that we that we tow and that we tow them specifically to shed dogfish and other other cheese you know species that could be choke species scapes or whatever so in my mind the more the more trawlers that are using these big mesh rope nets the less in discards we're going to have and that happens in the whiting fishery the squid fishery all the small mesh fisheries in southern new england i don't know about in new england with the ground fishery that's out of my realm but i for me all, all the boat every net we have now that we use they're out there towing these nets now and they're, they're not catching they will not catch dogfish unfortunately there's no code when we do our, our ebtrs there's no code for us to put down for this type of net so i've been talking to jason about this there's no way to go back and and verify it and even with with the observer coverage there's no observer code for them to to, to, to write down all they're measuring uh, the, the back end of that the, you know the bag they're not going to measure the meshes up front with that make a huge difference in in in, uh, in shedding dogfish and other 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 species and and also i've lived through the, when the dogfish rebounded and and they chased us all over the ocean i mean recreational and, and commercial you you we couldn't fish anywhere we would be laying to at night we'd have a, a fine day of tile fishing and at night i'd hear the dogfish bouncing off the boat and i knew that next day when I got up, I knew if I put a hook in the water, I was going to catch a dogfish on every hook. And, and you know, if the, if, the, if, the, if the commercial fleet's willing to roll the dice on this and stay open, then God bless them. That's, I'll, I'll vote for this. And, and if in 25 things turn south, then so be it. But I, but I don't think it's going to happen. I don't. Anyway, thank you. Greg Domenico. Mr. Chair, can I just ask a few questions from Jason and then I'll talk specific to the motion? Yes. Thank you. Uh, Jason, what is the um, the dogfish fishery right now? Um, what's the catch trends been for the last couple of years? In and around the 12 million pound mark? Yeah, Stephen, can you go back to the presentation? So 2021 was 10.4 million pounds. Okay. And 2022 to date is trending very similarly. But again, you don't know how Virginia is going to work sure. out. So there's a lot of uncertainty there. Um, and then um, it's generally trending. It was generally higher in the years before. Okay. Okay, so I'll... I'll I'm, I support the motion, but let me just explain why. Two things. First of all, the trends that Jason is talking about are going to continue, and um, I completely agree that it would be nice to keep this cutting house open. It would be nice to have some sort of inf incentive that would reach a, a, the 12 million pound uh, quota. But our quotas are always a target, and I don't think we're going to hit this quota. So I think you're going to get some savings already in the in the current trends and some conservation from the current trends. Not to mention what we're what we're going to be facing with um, major changes to our dogfish fishery from the large whale TRT, major changes from the sturgeon um, changes that are going to happen in this particular fishery. So I think you're going to see the trends continue to be in and around 10 million pounds. But more importantly. Um, specific to Dewey's motion is, is, is adopting a 1% management uncertainty. 0% uh, management uncertainty. 0% is what we use for the demersal species. So if we can do it for fluke, black sea bass, and scup, which I think are all zero, um, then why can't we do it for spiny dogfish? Thank you. Any other comments from the audience that hasn't already been spoken? Seeing none, I will call the substitute motion to a vote. Uh, raise your hand and have patience. Please don't keep hitting the button on and off so we can get a good count, please. Yeah. If you're in favor, please raise your hand.
16 in favor. Uh, please put your hands down. All opposed, please put your hands up. Two on the knees. Any abstentions? Or the nose, put your hands down, please. Any abstentions? Seeing none, the motion passes 16 2 with no abstentions. The substitute motion now becomes the main motion. Stephen, on my screen, it looks different. Can you just do some formatting there? Now that the substitute motion has become the main motion, Dewey, would you read it back into the record, please? I move that the council adopt a zero management uncertainty buffer with other with the other specifications used by the monitoring committee to result in a 12 million pound commercial quota. Any more comments or questions on this? I think if there's something new, please raise your hand that you'd like to mention, but I think we've discussed this enough. With that, I'd like to call the motion to a vote. All in favor, please raise your hand. We have 18 in favor. Please put your hands down. Are there any objections to the motion? Seeing none. Abstentions? One. So the motion passes 18 0 to 1. And is there anything else we need to do today, Jason? That's it for dogfish. Thank you. Thank you. Next agenda item will be a joint council and the SSC meeting. We're going to have Brandon Muffley in person, Sarah Gages, and Peter and Garrett DePiper. Jason, are you going to need a minute? Or Brandon, are you going to need a minute or two? We'll take a quick two minute break and be right back.
Garrett, do you want to test your audio while we have a, a moment? Yeah, Brandon, can you hear me all right? Yep, you sound good. And you, Sarah, you want to test your audio? Sarah, are you are you there? Hey, Sarah, this is Brandon. If you're near your computer, you want to do a, an audio check? Yep, I'm here, Brandon. There we go. Gotcha. Sorry about that. I stepped out to get water. <laughs> no, that's okay. Thank you. One minute warning. All right, welcome back everyone. Brandon, the floor is yours whenever you're ready. All right, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, and thank you, thank you council for for scheduling another joint meeting of the, the council on SSC. Um, I think these have been really productive over the last several years. We started this back in 2019 and I think they've been uh, really valuable to date. Um, so we have, we're gonna tag team some of the presentations today. So Mr. Vice Chair, if it's okay with you, the sort of the plan is to step through each of these particular parts of the agenda and maybe after each section um, have some council and SSC discussion before we move on to the next section because they are vastly different topics. And so I think maybe taking some time after each one, just making sure that we stay on track with time, um, I think would be would be best. So we have each of the um, 
separate presentations that we have, we did set up some different um, questions for you all for, for feedback and, and discussion. And so I'm gonna give a, an overview of what I'm thinking the SSC is likely going to address uh, in 2023 um, and run, run through those with you and give you a sense of what their schedule is likely going to look like and the types of topics that they'll cover. And Dr. Gages will um, give an update in regards to the ecosystem work group. This group was formed uh, about in the summer of last year to start integrating our ecosystem information more into our science and management process. And so she's going to give an update in regards to the sort of the progress that the work group has done to date and where they're going and get some feedback there. And Dr. DePiper will give an update on the economic work group. So as you know, the, they have been engaged with the council over the last year and a half or so. And so we just wanted to close the loop since that was technically a case study um, in regards to engaging the economic folks on the SSC. And so we just wanted to close the loop there and get any feedback from the council on where we may be going and get a sense of where they're go what kind of work they're gonna be uh, focusing on in 2023. And then finally, a, a last slide in terms of where we may go with these joint meetings in the future. And so just a quick refresher, particularly for some of the new council members that we may have in regards to the role of, of our SSC. And, and I am the staffer that's responsible for coordinating all of the SSC's activities, but they are our primary sort of scientific and technical, they are an advisory body to the council. Um, to provide you all with science advice and, and science guidance. They have their primary role, and you'll see this in regards to sort of their workload for next year. Their primary role is to develop and review acceptable biological catch recommendations. Um, and obviously, as you all just had a discussion in regards to spiny dogfish, the ABC that the SSC recommends is the sort of limit that the, S that the council cannot exceed. And so that's obviously a very important and pretty critical role that the SSC um, has in regards to the council function. But they have a lot of other areas that they are engaged in in regards, and this is outlined in Magnuson and also outlined in the council procedures um, in regards to providing advice on fishery management plan development, habitat, bycatch, and socioeconomics, um, thinking about when you're going through uh, stock rebuilding and harvest control rules and research priorities. And I tried to give some examples just within the past year of where the SSC has provided input on all of those different areas. So under fishery management plan develop, um, development, the, count, the SSC provided some input on the recreational harvest control rule. Thinking about habitat, uh, the SSC, along with the New England Council SSC, provided a peer review of the NERA products that you heard about earlier this morning. Um, and they also provided some input at their last SSC in regards to NERA work. Um, there, our SSC is engaged quite a bit on ecosystem and EAFM development. And so when we're looking at bycatch or discards, obviously our summer flounder management strategy evaluation dealt with recreational discards. Um, and we had a number of SSC members engaged in that effort. Um, our economic work group has been part of the research set aside program review. So providing some socioeconomic um, input and advice in regards to our research set aside program, thinking about rebuilding plans. Obviously our SSC has provided a lot of information in re regards to macro rebuilding considerations and how you would think about um, stock recruitment and what might be going forward there. They also do a lot of work in, in looking at scientific uncertainty when they're looking at their OFL-CV and creating that buffer between the OFL and the ABC. And then in regards to, and also providing some information and peer review on our recreational demand model. So again, some more economic advice. So RSSC is engaged in a lot of things outside of ABCs. Um, and this, again, this was all work just within the past year that our SSC is involved in. And so thinking about where they may be going in 2023 and just trying to think of how things might align. We traditionally hold four council or four SSC meetings that usually precede an, a council meeting. So a lot of the outcomes from an SSC meeting you'll hear at your following um, council meeting. So there's a lot of 
what you'll see um, in regards to what you saw in your implementation plan yesterday, you see a lot of similar things here that our SSC takes up that you will ultimately see in front of you. So our March meeting, it looks like, you know, a big topic we'll be reviewing our 2023 ILEX ABCs. Um, March is also tends to be a heavy ecosystem um, discussion. So we'll get the state of the ecosystem report. We'll get an update on our ecosystem work group efforts. Our summer flounder management strategy evaluation topic that came up uh, yesterday during our implementation plan, sort of the review of these short term forecast of species distribution. So our work that we're doing with Rutgers University. So all of that um, is likely going to happen at our March meeting uh, as encompassing this entire sort of uh, ecosystem um, issues. We also have a number of working groups that we want to get their products squared away before we move throughout the year. So our OFLCV, we have this guidance document that you all have seen on a number of occasions that are sort of a very more formulaic process for our SSC to consider when they are creating that uncertainty buffer, scientific uncertainty buffer between the OFL and ABC. So they have this guidance document, it's been updated once, but each time the SSC reviews that guidance document, they tend to find some areas that may, they may wanna tweak. And next year, we're gonna have a lot of specifications to go through when they're gonna be going through that OFL CV document a lot. And so we may wanna make some changes before we get to that um, next summer. And we also have some work of this, um, the constant ABC average work group. So if you remember last year, we had some issues um, with SCUP and black sea bass where we couldn't recommend um, constant or average ABCs because they violated our PSTAR, our, our risk policy. They resulted in PSTARs greater than 0.5. And so, you know, so you all task the SSC to come up with a new method for those situations where um, coming up with ways where we can, where the SSC can still provide guidance in regards to average ABCs in those circumstances. So we have a work group working on that as well. Now, again, that's gonna have a big impact in regards to where we may go with all of our specifications that we have. So there's a lot of work group uh, things going on. May will be a little bit lighter in regards to some reviewing of ABCs where you will, again, sort of probably finalize the process for that constant ABC um, average approach. And we'll start to look at the results of the research track assessments because there's so much information coming out of these research track. This past year, we thought it was, I found it very informative or helpful that we spent a little bit of time early on getting some of the new science results. Um, for butterfish and ilex this past year. And I think we'll spend some time in May doing that before we actually get into the details in July. The July meeting is gonna be a um, long meeting. I think that's probably gonna be three days where we're gonna have to set uh, ABC recommendations for seven different species. So you all are gonna be busy as well next August um, making ABC rec or making um, quota and you know RHL recommendations. And then in September, um, you know, trying to think about where we may be here. So the, recently we've been holding in September some offshore wind discussions amongst the SSC and more of the sort of the science implications of offshore wind development. Um, we will review our research priorities and probably doing a little bit more. We have our EAFM risk assessment review that's gonna be taking place next year. So we'll probably update the SSC and where, where we are with that and again, some more SSC ecosystem work group. And so that's sort of the general schedule, I think for next year. Again, we have these four uh, working groups that are gonna be quite active, the ecosystem, economic, the ABC average, and the OFLCV subgroups. So we have lots of things happening there. And then just a reminder that SSC members are also engaged in our stock assessment process. So they are either serve as chairs or actual peer reviewers of our of our different stock assessments. We have a number of different research or stock assessment related steering committees and working groups within the NRCC process that our SSC members are engaged in. So there's a lot of other things that happen by our SSC outside of our particular four meetings that we hold. And that's all I really wanted to touch on there. I have some questions here we don't have to touch upon all of them, but I just raised them for you all in terms of what you may wanna think about. 
it's helpful for me now as we begin to plan for 2023, if, if there are topics um, that you all are interested in getting the SSC to either review or provide feedback on, if you have any additional, if you have any thoughts now in terms of what those topics might be, certainly be interested in having a discussion there. Uh, are there any sorts of things that you all are finding missing in regards to what the SSC provides you? And this isn't necessarily from a topic perspective, but is there, are there things that you think the SSC could be providing more or different types of information on that that I can help sort of sort of filter that work between the council and the SSC? So are there, is there something that's missing or there's something different that the SSC can offer in regards to advice? and input that's currently not being provided. As I said, the SSC started having these offshore wind discussions. They now have a lead for offshore wind within the SSC. Dr. Dave Secor is our wind lead. Is there a role for the SSC to help you all in regards to you know, any types of advice or input that the SSC can provide in regards to offshore wind that may help sort of shape future discussions at the SSC in regards to that area? And, you know, there's this, is there interest in having a council member liaison to the SSC? So when Warren Elliott was the vice chair of the council, he attended many of our SSC meetings and it was helpful to have him there because sometimes sort of the, the SSC would have questions about where the council might be going on a particular issue and, and questions about some decisions that were being made and, and what might be happening. And having Warren there was, was quite helpful. I know Mike tries to make our SSC meetings at times with his schedule is pretty, pretty crazy. And so it's difficult for him at times. So it's not certainly not a requirement, but it's been helpful at times having a council member there. I certainly, we as staff and myself um, try to answer those questions, but sometimes having a council member there themselves is, is always informative. So these are just some general areas of, of feedback if, or no feedback, but uh, some questions for you all to think about in regards to this particular topic. And that's it for this one, Mr. Vice Chair. Any questions or comments for Brandon? Michelle Duvall. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thanks for that overview, Brandon. And I, you know, just in response to a couple of your questions and I think in terms of one of the additional topics or areas of interest, and I saw this further down in the briefing materials with respect to the economic work group, but you know, we during the implementation plan discussion yesterday morning, we talked about um, a replacement, you know, for the harvest control rule when that sun sets, but there's also another priority dealing with um, the other pieces of the the rec reform initiative, I think specifically some of the guidance, the technical guidance documents. And I, I do think it would be valuable to maintain the SSC's um, involvement in those topics. You know, I think uh, their review was very beneficial. I think it, you know, revealed a lot of things that we wanted to, pieces of information that would have been helpful for them to be able to provide us the best advice possible, you know, as this moves forward. So, you know, while I saw that under the economic work group anticipated, you know, things that they would weigh in on, I, I would like to maintain that. And then, you know, I just, I, I certainly appreciate the executive summary that's come along with the, um, the SSC reports. I think that's really helpful when you're trying to be targeted um, in your reading of briefing materials and everything. So I think that's that's great for jogging memories and then just a comment on the role of, you know, of having a council member liaison. I do think that that can be valuable. Um, you know, I know that there are other regions that do that as well, and I think it's been helpful there also. Thanks. Seeing no more comments or questions from council or the audience. Want to continue on, Brandon? Yeah, no, I'm, and just quickly to, to Michelle's comments, I think those are really helpful. Um, and I think Garrett will a, touch upon the harvest control rule stuff in his presentation. I think that is really where I think the economic work group was thinking in regard to that particular topic was on 
some of the models that have been created, right? So we have this recreational demand model that many of our SSC members have been helping support um, the development of that. So it's thinking about those economic models that could be useful in regards to the harvest control rule um, that we now have. But I know our SSC is certainly interested. Julia provided an update at our July SSC meeting in regards to where you are with the harvest control rule. And I know there's a lot of interest from the SSC on that as well. So that's so thank you for that feedback. All right, so I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Sarah Gages. She's gonna give an update on our ecosystem work group. All right, thanks, Brandon. Uh, thanks to all the members of the council for having us here today. Uh, I'm excited to give you an update on what we've been working on, but what I'd really love to get are some of your thoughts and ideas that can help us shape this work going forward. So next slide, please, Brandon, thanks. So the, um, just to remind you, the SSC Ecosystem Working Group is really trying to um, assist the council in developing both short-term and long-term objectives to bring ecosystem information into management decisions operationally. So every year, we um, the council gets the State of the Ecosystem Report, which is pictured here on the slide. We've been doing this since, I think, 2017 now. And the, the information is always appreciated and there's always a lot of questions, but I think um, in particular, Paul Rager, the SSC chair, wanted to figure out how we can make better use of this information in decision-making. So that's where the, the genesis of the working group. And so the, the reason that we're doing this is some both short-term and long-term ideas. First of all, we'd like to make their current process work better and make better use of ecosystem information. And so in particular, the OFLCV process that the SSC uses in determining the ABC is a process where we can some indicators and possibly developing thresholds for use in a revised ecosystem approach to fishery management risk assessment or any other council process where this type of information could be useful. And, and really overall to provide an increased range of opportunities for bringing relevant ecosystem information into management decision processes. So the, those are the outcomes that we're hoping to provide for you. Next slide, please. So we've got three objectives that we're working towards and they're described in a little more detail in the briefing materials, but I'll just go over them at the high level here. So the, the first objective defined by the group is a short-term objective, and that is to expand and clarify the ecosystem portion of our OFLCV determination process. So Brandon already spoke about this. We have kind of a table and a set of criteria that we go through when we make OFLCV decisions and there's one block in there which is using ecosystem information and there's a few specific things that we can look at in there already but i think the thought is to try to bring maybe more quantitative information in where it's available um, or to be able to use information that may be relevant to a stock but isn't currently in a stock assessment and so there's some simulation analyses going on right now by dr mike wilberg and others um, with some students using the MSE framework management strategy evaluation framework that the council has seen before in previous analyses for um, the harvest control rule and summer flounder and things like that. And they want to bring in information on, so let's say an ecosystem indicator was um, influencing the productivity of a stock. And if the SSC took that into consideration, would that improve the outcome of the OFL CV process? So they'll be looking at both um, if we use the information and we're correct, or if we make an incorrect decision based on the information, what will happen then? So it's that kind of what if analysis, and that's currently in progress. And that again is to just facilitate using information more directly in a particular decision. So we're hoping to see some more um, details on that work as it's coming along later on in October. We've just scheduled another meeting to take a look at that and we can provide an update on that later um, so that you can see the progress there. So objective two um, are what really the rest of the slides in this presentation are about. It's really just a couple more slides, but this is this is where I think we're um, trying to forge some new ground in terms of using ecosystem information. So this is a long term objective. We don't have to have all the answers right away. So it really is um, the council thinking through how it might want to use different advice in decision making processes that maybe don't currently exist or could be used in a different way. So. These are prototype processes to provide multi-species and system level scientific advice. 
um, things where we would be able to highlight trade-offs and could link to economic and social outcomes. So, so this is big picture information. And the first places we're starting are some initial indicators that some you've already seen related to ecosystem overfishing. So we'll go into those in, in the next slide. And another that's an analysis currently in development about regarding ecosystem performance given environmental conditions. So we think these are of interest to the council and we're just gonna present them to you today to get some thought, some of your thoughts on how you might wanna use them and what might be the most useful ways forward to begin to use this type of information. And then the third objective is, as Brandon already said, collaborating with relevant working groups um, in developing stock specific ecosystem and socioeconomic profiles. And so that we can bring stock specific ecosystem information into assessments and also possibly develop terms of reference for assessments. And this is sort of a medium term objective. So I won't go into a huge amount of detail about this here, but this is something that fits within the current council decision process because you're already using stock assessments as information into the process. This is just trying to bring more relevant ecosystem information into stock assessments using these socioeconomic profiles, which is kind of a structured approach to look at a lot of different ecosystem information presented alongside the assessment and allow uh, assessment working groups to decide whether that information should be formally included in the assessment or not. So we have several SSC members who are directly working with some of the research track working groups right now that are developing these products. So we're hoping to be able to show you those in the upcoming um, presentations as well and in up upcoming assessment cycles. So Brandon, you can go on to the next slide, please. Thanks. So, so here, this is the first of two slides where it'd be really great to get some thoughts from the council. The first is on this idea of ecosystem overfishing. So these are indicators that were presented in the State of the Ecosystem Report in 2021. And these are preliminary indicators. Um, they're based on a paper that was published that looked at worldwide uh, how what would be considered a threshold for overfishing at the ecosystem level. So looking at catch combined across all stocks in a certain area, um, how do you tell if it's too much? And the paper proposed several thresholds. And so what you're seeing in the figure on the right hand side of the screen are so an orange zone would be a place that this paper would say that was too much fishing rel relative to the amount of production in the ecosystem. So there's two different indices there and they measure it slightly different ways. But in both cases, the orange zone is the place that you don't want to be because that would be considered ecosystem overfishing, according to this paper. The green zone is a place where you're you're okay. So catches in that range are not considered ecosystem overfishing and, and you, you would be working within the ecosystem's capacity to produce um, fisheries. And the white area in between is sort of uh, undefined. <laughs> so it might be a place where you have maximum yield or it might be a place where you're starting to become unsafe. And so that was one of the things that was maybe less clear operationally how to use that area in the paper. And so these paper, the paper was based on, like I said, analyses from across the world. And so in starting to look at these indicators for use in the Mid-Atlantic, one thing that the SSC thought was an analysis that looks specifically at Mid-Atlantic ecosystems and their productivity to determine whether these thresholds proposed in the paper make sense in this region might be a good place to look. Um, and another thing is the SSC had some recommendations for improving the indicators themselves. So the, the group working on these is already bringing in additional catch and bringing in discards and things like that. So there's, there's some data issues that are being addressed. But I think the thing that would be really good for the council to think about for us to get your feedback on in terms of designing analyses to help you um, use this information is, is how would you use, if you, if you were told that the ecosystem was being overfished right now, what kind of decision could the council actually make? How would the council use this information? And, and so what supporting information would be most useful to help the council make a decision if you were told that one of these indicators was above the level, it was in the orange zone. And so some of the things the SSC has discussed on this is um, we do want to define this based on regional ecosystem productivity and not just, you know, take these thresholds measured based on global productivity and, and use them here. So we would want to redefine them. So that's something that we can analyze, definitely. 
Um, we're, the SSC was also thinking of the thresholds defining more of a safe operating space rather than trying to optimize how much you would take out of the ecosystem. So it wouldn't be so much, oh, you're not taking enough out of the ecosystem. To be optimal, you would actually have to take more. It would be more the thresholds are bounding a place where we think fishing isn't causing anything to go terribly wrong in the ecosystem, but we can still meet our social economic objectives within this range. Um, and we would definitely want to be able to identify trade-offs across species within the safe zone because there's a lot of different fishing combinations that can produce fishing within the safe zone. So which ones would be optimal or what type of information would be useful to the council to understand these trade-offs? Um, so another thought that the SSC had was, or the working group had, was how would we provide advice on options to correct the ecosystem overfishing? Is it just you have to dial back on one species? Are there several species? Are there combinations of species? And, and what type of advice would be most useful? And the SSC also thought that using social benefits to measure the outcomes rather than just, you know, tons of yield would be helpful. So th this was the, the discussion that the working group had, and the plan is to start designing analyses. Um, one thing that we can do right now is use some of our ecosystem models for simulation analyses and simulate different ranges of fishing and see what what things um, start going wrong in the ecosystem basically and at what levels and that can help us to determine whether these thresholds make sense at least in the ecosystem model and and can give us some insight into you know how we might want to adjust them but we are um, very open to other thoughts of types of analyses that you might want to see to support these types of decisions or, or how you might want to use this information so we can de design these analyses. So that's one set of questions for the council to consider. And then the next slide is another analysis that's in progress right now. This is another sort of system level analysis and it, it takes a bit of a different approach. It's called index numbers and the idea here is that you are combining multiple um, indices that are measuring ecosystem production in some sense and you're also looking at the output that you care about in the ecosystem so in in the illustration here the outputs are the a combination of things like commercial landings or it was actually commercial revenue recreational days fished and also um, how many right whales were in the system so you can combine these goals if you want to into the outputs and you can look at the environmental inputs, which in this case included things like um, primary productivity and aggregate fish, aggregate fish biomass. And um, I think chlorophyll, yeah, chlorophyll was included in there. And so you can ask if the ecosystem is performing at a certain level, how much output can we expect from it? And you can say, um, relative to the ecosystem, are you performing as well as you could be? And so the, the main key takeaways here are this has the ability to combine multiple indices that are currently separate indicators in the ecosystem report. So it could consolidate some of those and it could also focus them on objectives of interest to the council. So for instance, this analysis could be done just about seafood production and you could look at the environmental conditions that support seafood production and ask whether we're getting as much seafood production as the ecosystem state suggests we could. Um, so the fact that it integrates ecosystem indicators um, and that the outputs are linked to current management objectives are all real pluses. And the fact that we can develop these models for separate objectives was also considered a good thing. So I guess the question for the council is, if you had information on how we were performing on our against our management objectives, kind of relative to the ecosystem state, how might you use that information? What would be most useful in the decision making process? And also what outputs would be of most interest to the council. So our thought was, you know, starting with seafood production or recreational opportunities would be obvious objectives that the council has at the high level, but there, there may be others of interest and identifying any key environmental inputs that um, we think would be important to at least consider in the analysis would be useful. And so we're considering demonstrating a, an example for the upcoming state of the ecosystem report if we are able to do that. And so any thoughts you have right now on this type of analysis, considering that you didn't get a full blown, you know, detailed uh, description of the approach um, would be very appreciated. 
And so then the, the last slide that I have is really just in general, um, any other topics of interest from the council with the ecosystem working group would be very happy to hear. Um, Brandon's already mentioned an update to the EAFM risk assessment. And so that's something that the working group can definitely pitch in on. And, but there may be other things that the council is interested in doing. And so um, I'm here to listen. Thanks very much. Thank you, Sarah. Any questions or comments? Go ahead, Brand. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. I'm just <clears throat> so just to yeah, I think we we at the SSC and within the working group and even the broader group within the state of the ecosystem report are trying to take the advice that and feedback that we all hear from you on an annual basis. And some of that has been, you know, identifying some of these targets and thresholds at an ecosystem level. And so that's what that those first series of graphs that Sarah was showing is is trying to come up with those kinds of things because you all have been indicating, well, what does all of this information tell us? And can we can we identify, all right, are we in a place that we don't want to be at an ecosystem level? And so it's thinking about those things. And then again, to the second analysis that Sarah had is, you know, taking all of those individual components that we already are producing within the state of the ecosystem report and sort of you know, creating some indicators in regards to what might, you know, at an ecosystem level, what might be driving things and how can we sort of make management adjustments based off of that information. So we're really trying to take the feedback that we all are getting from you during the state of the ecosystem discussions and some of our other ecosystem work that we've had to try to create some we think meaningful, you know, sort of outcomes for you all. What would you do with this information if we were successful? And we, I mean, the SSC, because there are lots of smart people working on it, um, not including me, uh, putting these things together. What would you do if you had this kind of information in front of you? This is the kind of information you all have sort of been hinting at and, and asking for. And if we gave it to you, you know, what sort of feedback or how would you respond? Is there, are, are we not capturing things in some of these analyses that we're thinking about or any direction that you have, I think would be really helpful as we're getting these different analyses started. And so any feedback I think would be, would be great. We also, I would like to thank um, the state of the ecosystem. We are, as Sarah indicated, the group is starting to get ready for the 2023 report. Um, and that's going to happen really fast. And, and so prioritizing a lot of the um, sort of feedback that we've received from the councils, I had some council members prioritize some of those feedback and we also had the SSC do that. And so I think that information from the council and this and the SSC in terms of prioritizing some of those um, recommendations from the council in terms of what you would like to see um, in future as state of the ecosystem reports has been really helpful and the working group and the state of the ecosystem folks have taken that feedback and are really trying to work on those areas of focus for the 2023 report. Michelle Duvall. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Sarah, for that, um, for that overview. And I think with respect to the ecosystem overfishing indicators, you know, I really, the idea of a safe operating space really resonated with me and being able to use this information to identify trade offs across species. And so I, I think I realize I'm not quite answering the question that was being asked, but um, when I think about, you know, use of this type of approach to evaluate those trade offs and define that, define that space, I also think about, um, you know, incorporating some of the oceanographic changes, the climate changes that we're seeing into that, and can that be done? And, and is the group thinking about that? And I guess when I think about how, you know, the council might might use this as, you know, potentially during our spec setting process when we're thinking about, you know, setting um, setting limits for 
for fisheries for the following year. And if we know that there is a link or a trade off between a decision that we're making for one species versus a decision that we're making for another, you know, I think that that is one way in which I would see us using that information. Any other questions or comments from the council? Any questions or comments from the audience? Greg Di Domenico. Thank you. Um, Sarah, this is Greg Di Domenico. Can you hear me? Yes. Excellent. Uh, can you go back to slide nine? Could you tell me what you mean or what people uh, who do these type of analysis um, when they talk about use social benefits to measure outcomes? Can you expand upon that? Yeah, and I think um, other members of the working group who, including Garrett, could also jump in on that. I think the idea there was not was to not stop with a, a reference point that was just tons but would look at trade-offs between you know the value of a species in terms of money but also in terms of like community dependence on that species or you know it, there's there's a lot of different aspects to um the the threshold for overfishing and the impacts of it and it's not just you know fewer tons of fish in the ocean across the board it's more um, there's there's economics, there's markets, there's there's a lot of complexity there. I think that's what we're trying to get at. There was no prescribed we're going to use like maximum economic yield instead. Nobody said anything like that, but it was more um, thinking beyond uh, just tons. Does that help? It, it does, and um, I appreciate it. Could you go to slide 10? Um, could you? Perhaps expand upon your last bullet, uh, which talks about two separate models, one for seafood production, one for recreational opportunities. What is what would that look like? Yeah, so and I'm, I apologize for not having a lot of background on this to fully explain it like John Walden would. He does a much better job than I do. So so basically the the example that you're seeing here, um, the outputs are a combined um, set of outputs, a combined set of management objectives. So it includes recreational opportunities and seafood production and also, um, you know, endangered species basically in the outputs in the graph on the slide. Uh, this analysis is flexible enough that you can separate those and you can say, instead of blobbing seafood production, recreational opportunities and marine mammals all together into one type of output, you can look at them separately. And so you would have a model that would look at seafood production kind of the way we have it set up in the ecosystem report right now, where there's a, an indicator of seafood production. It's, it's generally landings of, um, of food species. And then we go through and we say, now what could be causing changes in landings? And we look at several different indicators. So for instance, a model of seafood production would use seafood production as the output, it would use just landings as the output, but then the inputs would be things relevant to landings. And so we may get a model that is um, a little more precise. Uh, and similarly, recreational opportunities would be the output in a separate model. And you could look at things that in the ecosystem that you expect to affect recreational opportunities, which might be different indicators than you would have for seafood production. So it's not to say that combining them is a bad idea. It's saying that you, you have the ability to split them and look at sort of what, what the potential is for each of those and what drives them. Does that help? It, it does. And one last question. Um, when, when, you were, when you talk about trade-offs, um, are you talking forage trade-offs? I think forage would just be one set of the possible trade-offs. I think we would generalize. We wouldn't, you know, we wouldn't only look at like, it, so by forage trade-offs, do you mean like which species do you catch versus another, or do you mean you can have more forage if you have fewer predators? I, I, there's a lot of dimensions, and I think the short answer is no, we wouldn't limit ourselves to just that, but it would be part of the mix, I think. Okay, that, yeah, I was talking about that 
last dimension that you <laughs> that you mentioned. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Shout of all. Thank you. And so Greg's question just um, raised an, another one for me specific to these index numbers. And I, I think, I mean, I do think that this would be, these would be useful. And, you know, I, I like the idea of separate models for separate objectives. I, I do think it's going to require more conversation to kind of figure out what the inputs should be should be for those two different things because I, and, and that's one that should be perhaps had in conjunction with our, our stakeholders, our advisory panel members, because I, I would expect that there would be a wide range of opinions on, you know, what should go into those things. Seeing no more hands raised, Brandon, would you continue please? Yep, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Let me get this. Okay, uh, and so we have a presentation now from uh, Dr. Garrett Piper, who's gonna give sort of an overview again of the economic work group and just sort of close the loop on this particular case study, get some feedback uh, on where we go from there. So Garrett, it's all up to you. Thanks, Brandon, can you hear me all right? Yep. Uh, Thank you, members of the council, for having us again. I wanted to express my appreciation for giving me the opportunity to speak to you all today. Um, next slide, please. Um, as many of you are aware, uh, the economic work group was um, has been working on the recreational set aside redevelopment um, assessment over the last couple of years. Um, it was pitched originally as a case study by the economic, well, as one of a number of potential case studies by the economic work group, um, and the council selected this specific topic as the case study in their December 20, uh, 2020 meeting. Um, and during that discussion, um, we flashed this specific slide up in front of the council and had some discussion around this. I'm, I'm bringing it back up here today because I wanted to highlight the fact that the process itself that we've engaged in was originally specced out to be collaborative, um, collaborative between the council, the economic work group, um, and the SSC. And so in, to ensure that that collaboration was uh, efficient and effective, we really wanted to come back to you all today and, and get a sense as to what you thought about the process itself. Um, and so as I'm going through the slides, it's gonna be relatively quick to allow for some discussion. Um, I'm hoping that the council will think about, you know, what you all have heard about uh, the economic work groups uh, work in supporting the research set aside redevelopment process um, and um, see if, uh, you know, reflecting on that, if there's any refinements we can make to the process itself uh, moving forward as we continue to work on behalf of the council. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, this presentation is going to go through um, what the process entailed by touch, uh, reviewing some of the touch points. Uh, so the touch points here I'm defining as the interactions between the economic work group and the council. We'll then transition to expected work uh, into the future and then pause for some feedback from the council uh, with respect to what's been discussed here. Um, and so over the the, the history of the case study, the economic work group worked closely with the council members and, and staff, um, particularly through the uh, research steering committee. Uh, we actively participated in committee meetings. We helped plan the research set aside workshops. There were four workshops undertaken in this process. Um, and then we had two formal updates to the council. Um, but beyond that, there were some additional maybe not informal, but um, intermediate updates that the council received through the research steering committee reports and the SSC reports uh, throughout this entire process. So again, thinking about the way that the economic work group um, uh, communicated with the council, are there specific things that we can do to, to, to streamline that process and make it more efficient? Um, along the lines of what um, Dr. Duvall kind of talked about um, uh, when Brandon was presenting the, the overview of the SSC functions more broadly. 
All right, so what do those touch points actually mean? Well, between December 2020 and June 2022, there were the economic work group engaged in 10 formal council meetings. What I mean by formal here is they were um, meetings that were open to the public and uh, uh, in, in, in meetings in which uh, the, the council conducted formal council business. Um, so this includes uh, both the committee meetings, uh, the, the, the workshops themselves, as well as the council meetings that we presented at. Um, the work also included six written reports and memoranda that we presented to either the committees or the councils or both. Um, there was a lot of um, issues discussed in those reports and memoranda, but I'm going to highlight a couple of these in particular. Uh, first off, we worked really closely with uh, committee leadership to develop a decision tree around what the redesigned program might look like. Um, and so that was really kind of the nuts and bolts of who was who would be involved, what the allocation of quota might look like, and what what uh, RSA trips might look like. Uh, but then we also really highlighted the importance of goals uh, and setting of explicit goals and redeveloping the RSA program. And the reason for this is because without knowing what you're trying to achieve, there's no way to design a pro program that's um, maximizing your probability of actually achieving those goals. Um, and so once the committee developed uh, a draft list of goals, then we could uh, qualitatively assess some trade-offs uh, based on the decisions uh, made on the design of the program um, and uh, really assess how goals could be affected or the, the achievement of those goals could be affected by the decisions uh, made on the program itself, the, the program, program design. Um, the, the work also included four formal updates to the broader SSC and then a number of informal meetings with community leadership uh, regional office staff, state staff, and others associated with the original RSA program in order to help ensure that um, as robust a, a view of that program um, as possible was kind of brought forward uh, in discussions uh, with uh, stakeholders and the committee. Um, and so before we move into future work, I do want to kind of highlight that um, the, the, the extent of the work that the economic work group kind of engaged in in the last year. Uh, so since last September, uh, we obviously were engaged with the research set aside program. That was our primary focus, but we also engaged in the summer flounder management strategy evaluation, the recreational harvest control rule, SSC review, and the recreational models SSC review. Uh, and, and this level of engagement um, in um, of economic expertise is, um, is above the, the recent norm in terms of, uh, of engagement. And so that's kind of the level we're, we're, we're looking to continue into the future. Um, next slide, please. Um, the workflow itself is expected to be a little bit more organic. Uh, and by organic, what I mean is I think it'll be driven by the expertise and the interests of the economists and others on the SSC. Uh, but and, and they're also being informed by council priorities, obviously. And so exactly what is undertaken will to some extent be um, circumscribed by the council priorities themselves, but we anticipate um, engagement in the following topics. Uh, we expect some additional research set aside projects uh, and support are likely uh, given that the council decided to move forward with the redevelopment uh, at this point. Um, we expect some support uh, of the ecosystem working group, as Sarah mentioned in the last presentation. Um, annual recreational specifications. This is in particular, as Brandon mentioned, um, supporting the work of Lucar Harris, which has developed uh, a recreational behavior model uh, of fishing uh, and uh, and how that can be used in recreational specification setting uh, on, on an ongoing basis. Uh, similarly, the recreational harvest control rule, the engagement there, at least at this point, would be through that modeling exercise. Um, although obviously we've already engaged in a SSC review of the recreational harvest control rule. And if the council has specific issues or topics that they'd like to have us weigh in on, we're more than happy to do that. Uh, we're specifically um, ensuring that we have additional capacity to, to address um, 
council priorities as they kind of come along as opposed to kind of um, not being able to, to to reserve that capacity. Uh, and then next month, early next month, we'll be we'll be um, meeting as a group to over, we'll look over 2023 council priorities and really reassess whether there's other places in which uh, we can engage and hopefully bring uh, economic expertise uh, to bear on issues of importance to the council in a way that helps the, your decision making. Um, so the, the economic work group itself is likely to be more of a coordinating body moving forward more than anything else. Uh, but moving forward, um, this gets to the meat of what I'm hoping we'll get some feedback on today is can we improve the process uh, that we've been engaging uh, with a, that we use to engage with the council uh, in the, the um, case study, particularly with respect to the frequency and types of communications, um, thinking back to how you heard about the work of, of the economic work group and, and what information was brought forward, uh, but also um, in terms of the ability of the council to provide feedback to the economic work group, uh, either formally or informally. Um, and with that, I'm going to kind of wrap up my presentation uh, and hopefully you all have some thoughts as to you know, what transpired and what could, we could work on moving forward. Any questions for Garrett? Comments for Garrett? Your hand broken, Michelle. I was going to say a non Disney word there, but I'll refrain until afterward. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I was, yes, my hand on the screen was broken. So um, thank you to, to Garrett for running through this. And I think just, you know, again, um, Huge thanks to all the members of the economic work group for their engagement with the, the research steering committee, you know, during the RSA re redevelopment process. I mean, from my perspective, I, I feel like, you know, the economic having the economic work groups expertise and um, their their input and feedback was really, you know, I think critical to the success of that uh, of that endeavor. And certainly, you know, as we talked about yesterday. As Chris alluded to, there's a there's a, there would be a lot more to do um, to before a full RSA, RSA redevelopment could occur. But I think the process worked. I think the process worked really well. Um, you know, I guess I would maybe look to other council members to see if you know the the two reports, like the sort of the interim report and then the final report at the end of the process, were enough opportunities for feedback. I mean, certainly the committee meetings were open to everybody. Um, everyone could attend. RSA is a really complicated uh, issue, and you know, so I I don't know. I guess I would look I would look to other folks. You know, maybe there's maybe one more update might have been helpful for folks who did not feel like they um, had enough time to review the materials or the work of the committee and you know, provide feedback on it. Brandon. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. I would, just to Michelle's point and just, you know, again, feedback from you all, you know, greater sort of economic um, engagement with the SSC um, was really the focus of our first joint council SSC meeting at the time was sort of those members that were on the SSC, those economic members on the SSC looking for sort of different ways for them to get engaged. And you all took a pause in, in thinking about new membership and we actually added additional economic expertise to our SSC to provide greater economic information to you all. And so we've spent a lot of time over the last few years investing in that at the SSC and here at the council. And so, you know, has that been successful in your view? What, what can we as the SSC, what can the economic work group do uh, differently, you know, in regards to the process that went, we went through with the, on the RSA program, was that, you know, was that successful? I mean, I, I think it was, and I think, certainly from committee's leadership, but from you all as the broader council. So I think that's the kind of feedback we're, we're looking for. 
as we just continue to keep this committee engaged, um, you know, where all do you see sort of that fit and what can we do differently, um, if, if, if anything, uh, is the kind of feedback we're looking for. Mayor Greed. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. Well, if you want anything, my concern is um, look at the, the different components of what comes the value of any particular rec or commercial fishery. Rec sector has a calculation or a factor for willingness to pay. Commercial sector isn't giving credit for their willingness to pay. I think that's a pretty big economic piece of the commercial fishing industry. What's, you know, what's the willingness to pay? What's the willingness to invest in additional pounds of fish or whatever? And, and I, I think that's something that really needs to be examined. Any more questions or comments? Oh, wait, sorry, can I just ask a clarifying question for Mr. Reed? So, so basically, you just want to make sure that the that there's parity with respect to what's presented on the commercial recreational side um, in terms of value. Is that what my understanding is? Yeah, that's right, Doctor. I, I think you call it uh, cost of opportunity or utility or something like that. I just call it willingness to pay because I'm I'm not anywhere near in your league. So thanks. That's definitely something we can work on providing more input to the numbers. Mike Bentney. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, just to follow on, I think, Eric, if I'm <clears throat> interpreting your, your comment correctly, and I, I think I agree, I think it's often what we hear on the recreational calculation side is sort of the total uh, the total value um, to communities uh, and and various uh, sector, you know, players within the within the sector. Um, um, for, you know, for recreational fishing opportunities. Um, but often the most, um, the, the data at hand on the commercial side is X vessel value. And, you know, maybe a more comparable, um, comparison would be, uh, to follow the economic, um, chain, if you will, from the vessel to the, the processor to it, till it ends up on a plate in a restaurant. And understanding then the sort of the more comprehensive, um, you know, value that that uh, that that fish uh, brings to to all of those components, as we do often on the recreational side. Like my my council training seven years ago, I asked about the economic multiplier, which is what you're referring to. The answer I got was every species has a different multiplier, but I've never really been informed of what that multiplier is. So I think that's really important for the commercial industry. What I'm also talking about is, is you know, willingness to pay is what's the enjoyment of commercial fishing to a deckhand, which is, I mean, <laughs> that might be a negative value. I'm not really all that sure if I remember correctly, but uh, there's also, also, you know, the willingness to buy a Virginia fluke permit versus a Rhode Island landing license, um, all those all those factors add up to uh, additional value that that's not um, considered when we talk about the value of the commercial fishery. So that that's where I'm coming from. It's a whole pile of stuff that's not included. Yeah, these are good points, and I, I know of a few endeavors regionally to look at uh, consumer surplus in particular and, and the value the consumers derive from seafood. Um, and so that obviously plays a role here as well, and it's something that um, I think we could at least um, encourage, if not directly engage in as an SSC. Thank you, and thank you for all the questions. Brandon. Yep, so there's just one one more slide or one more sort of topic if you all have any feedback. And so, as I mentioned, we started these joint meetings in, in 2019, and I think it's fairly unique amongst the councils to have a joint meeting of the council and the SSC. I'm, I'm not 
quite sure how many other councils do it. I don't think very many do. And so I just want to make sure that in holding these that we're finding value, both you from the council and that the SSC is is getting value and that and that they're informative. I don't want to hold them just just to hold them for holding them sake. And so I just want to make sure that we are addressing what we what we are trying to do. I mean, sort of the the original intent or a big part of the original intent was to get SSC members here at a council meeting. And so not just have a discussion around the table, which makes it really difficult when folks are online and and we sort of give presentations and then that's sort of the end, but to get them here. They stick around for hospitality and you all get to meet SSE members. You know, usually it's just the chair and Paul hasn't even attended a, a council meeting yet because uh, as soon as he took over, we had COVID. So Paul hasn't attended, but before that, John would attend all of the, the council meetings. So you only really got to know John. And so would, would there be value in sort of putting faces to some of the SSE members who are making and providing a lot of really important advice to you all. And so having some discussions to get folks around the table was, was really as much as the topics were important is really just to make some connection to make some connections. Bless you. Uh, I think was really important. And so we've lost a little bit of that because of the situation that we're in. Um, and so I'm just thinking about if, if you recall from yesterday's um, implementation plan, we, we did not currently have a joint meeting scheduled for next year. That maybe there is an opportunity to take a pause. Is there a way we can make this better? Um, you know, we just have an hour on the agenda, and so that's part of it. You know, it's a lot for an SSC member to travel for an hour meeting, and so if there if there are ways, maybe we can have a half day session. You know, um, where it's more likely we can get SSC members to to be engaged and have more of a discussion around the table instead of just some presentations and Q&A. So that's really what I'm thinking. And so maybe that's to hold it uh, these meetings less frequently. Maybe it's just we bring we bring folks together when a pressing issue has comes up. But I'm looking for if you all have any feedback on the value of these things or we don't need to hold them going forward. But just getting some some thoughts from you all um, in regards to how we may sort of hold these meetings um, and making sure that we're getting something productive out of them. So uh, that's my last slide. And so any thoughts on that? And then we're done. Thank you, Brandon. Any final comments to Brandon, Sarah, or Garrett? Yes, Michelle Duvall. Sorry for talking so much. I'm violating, I think, yesterday's uh, learning session. But I mean, I appreciate what Brandon said. And I actually had the opportunity to observe the very first one of these, which I think was in 2019, wasn't it? And I, I believe it was a couple hours, if I'm if I'm not mistaken. So that was before I got on the council. But it is a long, a long, it's a big ask of SSC members, you know, to come here for an hour and I do think maybe taking a pause and having some conversation, you know, with SSC leadership, with council leadership about, you know, is there more of a, a half day or workshop type of approach? Um, you know, I think some of the the issues that Chairman Reed brought up might warrant that type of approach. You know, I I don't always hear as much about um the economic and social analyses, and I think maybe there's not, you know, around the table as much understanding of those types of analyses and what can be done. You know, that's just an off the top of my head example of something that might be useful. I mean, most of our interaction with the SSC is receiving their advice on ABCs. That's, you know, certainly the bulk of it. So I think, you know, there are um, other topics that could be. Uh, that could lend themselves to, you know, more intense discussion. Thank you. Michelle, Adam Nowalski. Thank you very much. So I have found these meetings to be very valuable, very informative. Uh, I think they are accomplishing the goals of beginning the greater dialogue that we need to have. Uh, Dr. DePiper said it himself that the 
inputs we've received, particularly on a socioeconomic side, have been above the recent norm. As Dr. Duvall just said, most of her experience has been with the SSC just providing ABC and biological advice. Uh, I would endorse the idea of a half-day type of joint meeting moving forward. I think that could best be accomplished by conserving resources, by trying to schedule one of the SSC meetings, perhaps during the same week as a council meeting. Uh, obviously, you wouldn't have one of the things that they're providing advice about. They need time to go back and do a report for that meeting. Um, but I think you could have an efficiency of a location getting everybody together at the same time. Uh, I think a half day meeting could look like two hour and a half to two hour sessions where one session, the SSC members bring an idea forward that they've been working on. They think the council might uh, be interested in hearing about uh, the other half of the afternoon or morning could be the council bringing back an issue to the SSC that they're interested in talking about. Uh, I think as we move forward, uh, if there is a willingness to go down that road, one of the things we should look at, and even maybe if we don't, uh, is we should probably go back and take a look at the council SOPs. I don't believe they've been revisited in over five years at this point. They do detail what our specific asks of the SSC have been. Most of those asks that are itemized in there do revolve around biological questions. Uh, as the SSC has gotten more involved, it has made them more visible to the public, uh, has brought the public forward in asking questions because they've been limited to the ABC oriented advice for over a decade asking, well, why is the SSC weighing in on this? Um, I think all our SOPs for our a SSC involvement uh, have some of the latitude for the advice we're getting. But I think it would be a good opportunity for the SSC to take a look at them and say, are we protected in this? So we don't have to answer the question of why are you giving that advice and also protect us. And so we can answer the question and say, yes, we do formally want this advice moving forward. So I would encourage that as a step for both the SSC and staff to take a look at, bring that forward. Uh, and again, I would encourage the interaction moving forward. Uh, so both that group can learn from us and we can continue to learn from them. Thank you, Adam. With that, I want to thank Brandon, Sarah, and Garrett. And that concludes this agenda item. Before we close for the day, we have a presentation of the 2021 Rick T. Savage Award. This award is given to a person who has added value to the Mid-Atlantic Fish and Management Council process and management goals through significant scientific, legislative, enforcement, or management activities. This year's recipient served on this council for 14 years. He did 11 years as a state official from New York, and he served one term as a, a obligatory seat from the state of New York. And with great pleasure and proud, I'm proud to announce this year's 2021 Rick T. Savage Award to Mr. Steve Hines. Mid-Atlantic Fishery Management Council presents the 2021 Ricky Savage Award to Steve Hines with gratitude and appreciation for his positive influence and contribution to the conservation and management of the Mid-Atlantic Fisheries. His leadership, service, and dedicated contribute, contributed significantly to the successful stewardship of the marine resources and dependent fishing community. Congratulations. Thank you. Okay. Oh, okay. You know you can have you can have the box. You can have the. I know you're going to have the mic because I've never seen you not talk. Well, no. <laughs> okay. I did notice. If anybody else noticed it today, after being on the council for 14 years, 
he snuck in the meeting here for, I don't know, a few minutes, and he didn't seem like he wanted to stay very much longer. He couldn't wait to leave. We were worried he wasn't going to come back there for a while. No problem there. So I'm not exactly sure what I did to deserve this. I don't know, uh, but uh, I'm deeply grateful to the committee and the council, and I will treasure it. Um, I have to say that I have a actually have a lot of difficulty speaking in public. And every time I turn on one of these microphones, it's like the devil staring me in the eyes with these red lights. Um, and when I first sat down at this table, I was very intimidated and didn't feel like I really belonged here. But um, I got a lot of mentoring and encouragement from my uh, fellow uh, New York council members. I also got a lot of mentoring and encouragement from people from other states. You know, back when I first sat at this table, we didn't, we weren't in our little groups here, group by state. They're all mixed together. And if I had to make one suggestion, I think maybe you ought to think about going back to that way. That way you get to know each other a little better. Although we do a pretty good job. But I, but I, I learned then really what, what it was to be part of a, a group like this. I hear um, often mentioned the council family, and I did feel like I was part of a family, uh, and that really helped me a lot. Uh, I really have always appreciated the just absolutely brilliant staff that we have here. Um, they always come through. Uh, I always look forward to the staff memos on the, on the specifications. I, it, it just, I, everything that staff would do, I paid very close attention to, uh, just, just a very informative and, and very important. Also want to uh, acknowledge the people that uh, sit in the back of the room. Um, yeah, you know, I'm looking right at you. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, you know, they're, they're incredible uh, part of this, this whole process. And it's public in, input on the, on the process is so important. And these folks show up all the time. They're, they're here. Um, religiously it's uh and it's it's been great i've gotten to know some of them i've developed some friendships that have really survived um some of the differences that we have on some things um and in summary i just want to say it's it's been an honor and a privilege to serve the state of new york and the nation in the, in this capacity and i i wish you all great success moving forward thank you All right, that's going to conclude today's business. There is one more thing that I would like to mention. We are having hospitality in room 291. Those that use it that couldn't find it last night, follow somebody that's been there before. It's hard to get to. Uh, there's going to be quite a bit of appetizers, some sea bass, shrimp, scallops, uh, lobster salad, 